TV Ottawa. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News. Now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, November 12th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 9 degrees, 12 in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. A couple of councillors among the first to hop on board the LRT this morning for the first time in 54 days. The rails were humming again. Seven trains shuttling people back and forth from Blair and Tunney's to the downtown. West, Jeff Leeper met East, Tim Tierney. The two rode the train for their trip to City Hall. Leeper says he a lot of Alstom staff he saw on hand at the stations just to make sure everything went as planned, tweeting that out this morning. The city still mired in what kind of investigation into the entire LRT project will be done. Some want a judicial inquiry. Others say the city auditor general examination is enough. Now the province stepping in to say calling a judicial inquiry is not out of their playbook since it has considerable investment in both phase one and phase two under construction and a request for phase three funding as well. The newest member of city council in Ottawa will be sworn in today to jump into that file and the rest. Kathy Curry tells City News there are a lot of concerns, including development in the Kanata Tech Park. Traffic, uh, what does it mean for uh, jobs? What does it mean for our lives? What does it mean for visibility? Where I live, I won't be able to see across the road anymore. Yeah, so there, yeah. those kinds of concerns. The official swearing-in ceremony for Curry is this morning, and you can hear more from the newest city councillor coming up today on The Rob Snow Show. City News Time 901. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. The wet weather will move out. We'll have some clearing today. Brisk wind, the high near 12 degrees. It'll be mainly clear this evening. A few showers return, though, overnight. Three degrees for the low. And for the weekend, cooler air, some showers, and possibly some flurries as well, especially for Sunday. Highs near 7. For today, the high 12. And right now, raining 9 degrees in Ottawa, 12 in Smith Falls. A group of scientists advising the provincial government on COVID-19 is going to release the latest pandemic projection today. The COVID-19 science table expected to publish the modelling at 11 o'clock this morning. Now, this comes amid a resurgence of COVID cases that has prompted the province to further uh, withhold the reopening plans for certain businesses. Dr. Kieran Moore, the chief medical officer of health, says he made that decision because of rising case counts Yesterday, the seven-day average of new COVID cases is at 532 compared to 383 one week ago. Toronto police say a judge will take into consideration the addition of another victim when sentencing the man convicted in the van attack in 2018 that has now claimed the lives of 11 people. However, they say Alec Manassian will not face another murder charge following the October 28th death this year of a 65-year-old woman who had been in hospital since she was severely injured back on April 23rd, 2018. Manassian was convicted in March of 10 counts of first-degree murder. A Toronto police spokesperson says while the death is considered a homicide, the charge cannot be upgraded to first-degree murder because too much time elapsed since that woman was injured. Negotiators at this year's UN climate talks in Glasgow appear to be backing away from a call to end the use of coal and phase out fossil fuel subsidies. Swedish climate campaigner Greta Thunberg doubts real change will come out of this meeting. We will most likely not see any big results at these meetings. Uh, there needs to be a big public pressure from the outside and that is not what it is right now. People in power can still um, can still do almost whatever they want as long as they, they say some nice words. Now, Thunberg attended the start of the talks in Glasgow and spoke at her weekly protest outside Sweden's parliament. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Separating headlines from hearsay. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Ah, Friday. Made it. And remember, be happy you don't have to shovel the rain. Good morning. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show on City News. We're always thrilled 
when you choose to spend part of the day with us, we have some great Friday fare on the way. Standing by is Hall of Fame broadcaster and best-selling author Lowell Green with a hot take on the news of the week. Then it's Derek Fage, the host of Daytime Ottawa on Rogers Television. He's been filling in for Sam LaPrade this week on City News. Derek uh, will be on again this afternoon between noon and 2 o'clock. And Randall Denley, post-media columnist and author. And we have a lot to get into with everyone. It has been such a busy week. Uh, light rail. To me, light rail continues to be the dominant story in the nation's capital. I mean, it's back up and running today, I guess. I guess, sort of. I mean, the city did pay for 17 trains, all told. And after all of them being down and out, down for the count, at a commission for 54 days, uh, seven of them are running again this morning. Seven, seven, seven. And um, everyone, I bet, in authority at the city of Ottawa has their fingers crossed, hoping nothing breaks again. Please don't break again. It's a heck of a way to run a transit system in a city of a million people. But outside, outside of that monumental and historic service disruption, there were lots of other developments on the light rail file this week. The majority of the city council and the mayor voted against having a judicial inquiry in what could become, I think, a defining moment for this city council and the upcoming municipal election campaign. To me, if I was running an election campaign, either against Mayor Watson, or if I wanted to challenge one of these councillors in a ward race, that's an issue I would jump all over. And I would just pound and pound and pound away on that. I, I, I would repeat it time and time and time again to anyone who would listen every door I knocked on. Not only did my opponent vote for this system and this crazy maintenance contract, with, a, with a, a company with a notorious background to begin with. When it, my opponent did that. And when it came time to get to the bottom of things and dig deep into what happened with this file, my opponent voted against it. I mean, it's an election message, ladies and gentlemen. It's an election message that just writes itself. You know, traditionally... It's been very, very difficult to, f to defeat an incumbent city councillor. But I think that vote on, on that inquiry, with that vote, it may have gotten a little easier this week, and I think some of these councillors may live to regret voting the way they did on that one. And then, of course, there was the email from Bob Shirelli that he leaked to the CBC. I mean, that was a haymaker of a thing. The... You know who you're going to screw with this email? <laughs> you know who you're going to screw with this? That email uh, addressed to Bob Shirelli from City Hall, heavy hitter, up to his eyeballs in light rail decision making the whole way along with the billable, billable hours to show for it. Brian Guest. Uh, that could be a game changer in this whole thing, too. Because that drew in the Ford government. Because the firm that's led by Brian Guest, Boxfish, as Brian Lilly, read Lilly today in The Sun, uh, it hasn't just been working on light rail projects here in Ottawa. It's been doing consulting work on light rail files all over the place. Toronto, Hamilton, Peel. So that's why it's captured the attention of the premier and his people. You have a heavy hitter saying, if there's a judicial inquiry, you're going to screw me. Well, what do you mean by that? And the premier and the Tories, the PC party in Ontario, uh, I think they're going to be looking for an Ottawa issue to seize upon here for the upcoming provincial campaign Election day in Ontario is just a little more than six months from now. The PCs hold four Ottawa area ridings as it stands. They have uh, Carleton, which is probably pretty safe. But can you say the same thing about the other ones? Canada, Carleton, Nepean, Ottawa West, Nepean. 
Those three are all liberal ridings at the federal level, so you know the Tories would really, really, really want to keep those seats blue. So to me, politically speaking, I mean, there's great motivation for Premier Ford here. You turn this light rail fiasco not just into a light rail fiasco or an Ottawa light rail fiasco, but a liberal Ottawa light rail fiasco. And look at me, I'm Doug Ford, DOFO, the only one interested in getting some answers for you, the taxpayers. And I you know, might sell with the NDP crowd, too, because the local lefties, I mean, let's, the local lefties have been the ones pushing for the judicial inquiry from the start anyway. Me and the local lefties. Yeah, there's a great write-up in the paper today, by the way, this morning from Muhammad Adam, headlined, Watson's Way. It's really good. It's like a trip back in time. It's a fabulous read. This is the 30th anniversary of Jim Watson in local politics. 30 years. But you have to wonder what will all of these light rail problems mean for Jim's political future? And, and the big question is, will he or won't he run again? We already know Bob Shirelli wants to run for mayor. Catherine McKenney told the CBC this week they're thinking about it, and I don't think it's out of the question, just given recent events. If you're paying attention, a pair of op-eds in the newspaper within a couple of weeks' time, people whispering things in my ear that Councillor Matthew Fleury wants to run for mayor. And rumors of a Diane Dean's candidacy have been out there for a long time. So next year, I mean, we could have a, we're going to have a provincial election, but a, we could have an epic mayor's race. 2022 is going to be a heck of a year in politics. Now, also on the show this morning, Ottawa's newest city councillor, Kathy Curry, is getting sworn in today, and then it's right down to business for the new ward councillor for Canada North. She is very impressive. Very impressive. Wow. Uh, I had a chance to speak with her this morning. We'll bring you the interview later on. Steve Ward on sports. The slump goes on for the Ottawa Senators. Depleted lineup because of COVID-19, like nine players out. And will Aaron Rodgers play this weekend for the Green Bay Packers? Is one week of anti-vax penance all it takes? If you're one of the NFL's top stars, MPP's back this week for Queen's Park Week in Review. And, of course, you're in the middle of every Rob Snow show during the talkback hour. Your hour coming up between 10 and 11 o'clock, an hour of phone calls, an hour of opinions, the hottest hour of talk radio in town. Just ask around. Today, it's the Friday free-for-all. And that's our favorite hour of the week around here because it's wide open on topics. I have things that I want to talk about, but all of that is secondary. You are primary. Whatever it is that's on your mind, let's get into it. It can be about a big news story. It doesn't have to be in the news at all. The most popular topic all week on our phone lines, pit bulls and the ban on pit bulls in Ontario. Doug Ford now says he's not going to end that ban. It's amazing what another mauling by a pit bull will do to change a politician's mind. At the big climate conference again this week, uh, COP26, today's the last day to save the world. Remember, it's one minute to midnight. O'Toole, Civil Liberties Caucus, Shadow Cabinet, Vaccine Mandates for MPs, Case Counts Up in Ontario, Anti-Vaxxers, Crashing Remembrance Day in Kelowna. You idiots. You're a disgrace to the country. Whatever it is, we're open to booting it around as we await the weekend on the Rob Snow Show on City News. So the birth of Absinthe was uh, 2002, I think, 2003. And I was working at Urban Bistro um, happily uh, where uh, Allium is now. Uh, and then uh, this space where Holland Cafe was uh, came up. It's on the corner of Spencer and Holland. And uh, I spoke to the landlord, and there's a lot of interest from a lot of other people, but he and I just, you know, got along super well, and he put a lot of faith in me. So uh, Carmen Turner is his name. He, uh, he gave me the lease to the place and, and really pretty much gave me all the equipment in the place. So I was really lucky. I've been really lucky with landlords that way, actually, both my current landlord and Carmen Turner, because um, if there hadn't been Carmen Turner, there wouldn't have been Absinthe. So we were there for a few years, 
uh, and just sort of outgrew the place. And then now we're here. It's obviously been tough, and it's been tough for everyone. I mean, that's the, you know, for it's the, been the big democratic sweep of like in restaurants and the hospitality and the arts that we were talking about earlier. It's like everybody's been impacted pretty much the same. Um, from everybody that I talk to, we're down 80, 75, 80 percent. We're, and we're climbing out now. Um, I think the, one of the saddest things is like we, like everybody, we went down to two employees from 25. Um, and we're now at four and we're bringing two new people on this week. So we'll be at six. So it's, you know, little steps. So it's been tough. It's, you know, um, I've got the most expensive uh, clubhouse ever here because some days you come and you don't do any business, but you're here. But I'm, I'm grateful for what I do have. I think everybody's optimistic now, um, n not necessarily just about the vaccine, but about like the, the vaccine, spring, being able to be outside. I think you're gonna see a lot of like pop-up things happen in parking lots and on sidewalks and all. Then like that, rather than being actually inside somebody's commerce, I think we'd like to take it outside. Um, I know my staff would. My staff like the outdoors now. All of a sudden, you know, all four of us, um, six soon. Uh, but um, we'll we'll be doing stuff, some business in the patio in the parking lot, and we have a patio up front. And I think other, and I hope other restaurants and stores will do the same. I hope that they take advantage of like the sidewalk and doing sort of, you know, uh, guerrilla marketing and stuff like that and really shaking it up a bit. You can find us at Absinthe Cafe at 1208 Wellington Street West in Hindenburg. And you can find us online at absinthecafe.ca. Firm. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. Good morning, Lowell Green. Ah, uh, good morning, Rob Snow. I, I have a little bit of information for you. You do. Um, okay. We, our uh, light rail system has been down 54 straight, year, uh, straight years, <laughs> seems like years, <laughs> 54 straight days, right? Yes, yeah, up and after, running today. After so, being yeah. open for what, about two years, right? Roughly two years, yeah. yeah. Okay, I just want you to know that the Montreal Metro system yes. is now 54 years old. Okay. And uh, in just two years, our system has been shut down far longer than Montreal's system has ever been shut down in 54 years. As a matter of fact, I've, I've, I did a fair amount of research on this, was quite surprised. Uh, according to um, the Montreal Metro, the people that I spoke with there, they do not believe that the Montreal Metro system has ever been down for a full day in the total of 54 years it's been in existence. Wow. Uh, keep in mind, it's 78 kilometers long, et cetera, et cetera. It's much, much longer. But what a, what a record. In two years, we have exceeded all the shutdown time that they have had in Montreal for 54 years. This idea that somehow or other, other cities are having all kinds of problems. I'm not denying that, that Calgary, for example, had a few problems. But there has not been a city that I am aware of in the Western world which has had any near, anywhere near the kind of problems or shutdowns we've had here in Ottawa, which really begs the question. Why the hell would we not have a judicial inquiry? Why would we not get to the bottom of this? What happened? Who is responsible? Is anybody responsible? Why are they responsible? Mm -hmm. Was any money changed hands? Mm -hmm. Why did we change? Why did we uh, hire the, these these as you say a, a firm that's just notorious? Um, I, I mean, there's any number of questions that need answering. And I guess the number one question: Why would the majority? And I, I note that a rather small majority. But why would the majority of city council vote not to get to the bottom of well, it? Well, they say it takes too much time and costs too much money. Bull, baloney. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, how much time has, has been lost now? How much money? We have, you know what? This, uh, it could very well be that the, the reason that they don't want an inquiry is that it probably would make some members of city council look pretty bad, including perhaps even the mayor. I don't know. But I think that we, the taxpayers, who not only have to pay for this, but have to endure the shutdowns, the disgrace of it, I think we have a right to know what the hell happened. 
We have a right to know that. Yep, yep. We're paying. The well, bill especially here. now, We're especially now. Dollars. I mean, I'm sorry, Lowell, to interrupt here, but no I mean, problem. you, you, no. ha- you, you know, and Brian Guest. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but yeah, like ultimate city hall insider here. Okay, yeah. um, you know, worked in Bob Shirelli's office, worked in Mayor Watson's office, has this consulting group, does work. Just read Lily's column today. Um, work all on, on light rail projects here in Ottawa, all over Ontario. And, and you know, it's Bob who leaked this email to the CBC. Look what Brian Guest sent me. And in the email, he says, uh, I'm going to get screwed by this. Shirelli says this. I haven't seen this. Shirelli no, Brian, he's no, get screwed. no, no, no. This Brian Guest fellow says, why are you pushing, Bob, why are you pushing for this public inquiry? Because Bob, uh, Bob Shirelli said if he was mayor, he would have a vote on a public okay. inquiry, right? And okay. Brian Guest emailed him and said, I'm going to get screwed by this if we have a Why public. would Brian Guest be screwed by it? Well, he's a major consultant on the light rail project. Okay. He all has, right. He, all right. You filled me in there. Yeah, and I'm yeah, sure yeah. you filled in a good many other people as well. Good for you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I see. So so he is feeling that maybe he did something that he shouldn't have done or didn't do the Who knows? Read, in a, read into it what you will. Read into it what you will, I guess. Well... I know, I'm going to tell you something. I, so, uh, I, so now Doug Ford says, yep. because Doug Ford, when he was in Ottawa the last time, he was asked about, you know, are, do you have confidence in Ottawa's ability to deliver light rail? Because the province is pouring billions of dollars into light rail in Ottawa, yep. right? 600. And yep. he said, oh, I'm sure the people of, you know, the the mayor, they'll all they'll get it all fixed. And then, a, you know, a week, 10 days later, he, he's threatening to call his own judicial inquiry into the whole thing. Well, I don't blame him. I mean, I if, uh, to me, this responsibility rest solely on their should rest solely on the shoulders of city council if, if, if city councilors were in any way responsible if they really cared about the taxpayers and the money etc etc they would demand it, it should have been unanimous that they demand a judicial inquiry they have a right to know as well because I mean there's no question that it could very well be that some members of city council did something they shouldn't uh, and perhaps didn't examine it enough didn't do enough due diligence I don't know and but that's one of the problems who the heck does know well so, I'm, I'm you know when you look into say judicial inquiries into problems that have happened in other cities uh, what it usually is if there's if there's anything to it at all what it usually is it it involves problems in the bureaucracy it's people in the bureaucracy that are doing things that they're not supposed to do and the, oh, and the oversight is so weak and the governance is so weak that they they can get away with things you know so you know my here's my position yeah if 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 this situation does not call does not justify a judicial inquiry then we should scrap all judicial inquiries this thing cries out for a full inquiry what went wrong mm-hmm. we are looking at a situation here that i think is going to be with us forever uh, i don't think that people will ever really trust this system unless we can get it running with no problems for the next two or three years which seems highly improbable to me i think uh, uh, one of the problems i I think that we we face here actually it's twofold i don't think nearly as many people are going to go back to work as as did prior to the pandemic yeah. which means lower ridership yeah. and i think that a lot of people just do not trust this and will do everything in their power to avoid riding on this freaking train yeah you've got a bunch of things that are coming together you have the back to work situation yep. which has totally changed especially in this city with the federal government workforce yep. you have covid uh, uh some people will just not want to be on public transit if they can avoid it they'd rather be in their own vehicle Precisely. they don't have to wear a mask they're not at risk of of, of either spreading covid or catching covid um and and um uh there was something else i was going to say but never let mind. me ask Doesn't you matter. this yeah, rob yeah, snow yeah, yeah. Uh, and the safety I, I issue, yes, the safety issue. Do you ever issue. take yeah. the train? Have you ever no, taken no, no, the train? No, 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 no. I have, I have ridden light rail. Yeah, yeah. All yeah, right. Yeah, let yeah. me ask you this: Supposing you you lived uh, in the West End, and ordinarily you would take the train, would you get on that train now? No, I wouldn't get on the train. No, Why not? No, no. Well, uh, convenience, security. And uh, safety, reliability, all you don't kind, trust uh, it. right, right, yeah, yeah. You I don't, don't trust it. Uh, well, I, you know, I don't trust it from a l- reliability point of view that the thing's just not going to conk out halfway to where I need to be uh, until the, uh, you know the replacement bus shows up. Or this whole idea, what I find really unsettling about this is that the, in this latest derailment, 
the wheels were off the track and nobody was any the wiser. The operator had no idea. The, the thing rolled into the station, left, let passengers off, passengers got on, and it had already derailed by that point. And then it had pulled out of the station. It was going over a rail bridge over Riverside Drive for crying out loud. I mean, holy yep. smokes, it could have been disastrous. Yes, it could have been disastrous. No question. You know? no, yeah. no question. And, and, and how there's no alert system or anything to alert people that it's not uh, that, the, 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 the we operator. We need a judicial inquiry. We need to know. Yeah. Uh, you, can, you can throw up all the obstacles that you want, and very clearly some people are, cost and all the rest of it. But, I mean, we, we in the end, it boils down to this. We, the taxpayers... The rate payers of this city, mm -hmm. the commuters of this city, have a right to know. And I think that, among other things, uh, that the inquiry would, would perhaps be able to reassure us that, in fact, uh, all the proper steps have now been taken. That, I think, would be part of it as well. So it might help to reassure us that this thing, this thing after all of this, is safe to ride. But I'm going to tell you, I, 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 one thing I'll tell you right now, I've been speaking with, with Doug Ford's office, and I think there is every chance that they are going to call for a judicial inquiry. I mean, the the, the problem. They, they not only not only are ratepayers in Ottawa on the hook for this, but ratepayers throughout the entire province are on yeah. the hook. And yeah. in fact, right across the entire country. But I, mean, I think that it, it's the responsibility. If the city's not going to do it, then I think that the province has a responsibility to say, hey, "Wait a minute, we can't pour another six hundred million or another billion dollars or whatever it is into this until we find out what the hell's gone wrong." Because for all we know, this, the the problems still exist there. Maybe maybe we have not remedied the real problem. We yeah. need to find out what it is <laughs> on a different issue. Yeah, yeah. Very quickly, two minutes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, this, you know, I, Rex Murphy has a, has a very good column. I don't know if you read. I, he's he's yes, my hero. Sure. Yeah. yeah. He, he asks. He says, you know. Do we really need to do everything? Do we really need to essentially bankrupt this country, drive several hundred thousand people out of work, uh, you know, risk the economy of the entire country, beggar two provinces in order to fight 1.6 percent of global emissions? Why? He said, here, here is China going off every single day building another coal-fired plant. Yeah. No, but, you know, nobody seems yeah. the least bit concerned about this. But we're paying a terrible, heavy price. Well, it's not he, just... It's it's not just you know. It's not just one point six percent of global emissions. It's it's the cut to those emissions is you know a promise we're going to cut one point forty percent of one point six percent. But right? why? So, I mean, yeah. I mean, why why are we why are we doing yeah. this to ourselves? I you know, there's there's no question that the, the climate, in my opinion, is changing somewhat. But I mean, do we really have to take these steps? Why? I mean, I, I, as far as I can see, there is not another country on Earth that is doing to itself what we are doing. We are destroyed. Do you realize the oil? I'm sure you do, Rob. Yes. You're a smart guy. Yeah. The oil and gas industry has been the number one industry in this country. About 20 percent of the GDP, under ordinary circumstances, created by oil and gas. Yeah. It is the major employer. It is the major provider of wealth. Most valuable we export. Most most valuable welfare. export, most valuable export. Absolutely, yeah. and, and, but I'm, I mean, so we're we're going to destroy that. Yeah. I, I just, I mean, there's no question that Trudeau wants to destroy this. He wants to create this new nirvana, this yeah. green, green. They're calling it the just, the just transition, the just transition. But, we're going to. Yeah, there, there's a, all sorts of other. Well, what are we yeah. going to replace it with? Foreign oil, I guess so. But that's the 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 real question here is why are we doing this to ourselves? May, may, there's nothing wrong with having to, you know, doing everything we can to cut back. But what, for example, benefits are coming from the carbon tax? I mean, the cost of living is skyrocketing out of control. It's only going to get worse. A good chunk of that is the carbon tax. What has it accomplished? Nobody's driving, driving smaller cars, etc. I mean, why, why are we doing this? All right. what, what's the point? 1.6% of uh, that's all the emissions. Sure. And in all probability, our forests and swamps are sucking up far more than that. But, I mean, uh, you know, we, we, we'll cut back. We could close off everything. We could go back to the Stone Age here. And you know what? Global emissions would still continue to soar because what? China has installed another 27 coal plants. Okay. I mean, Gotta go. Gotta go. Nuts. Gotta go. At a time. At Good a time. Morning. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I, that's how I could wrap up every conversation with Lowell Green every week. Uh, quote, unquote, it's nuts.
Uh, we're back after <laughs> back after the news with Derek Fage. This is City News. in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, November 12th. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 9 degrees, Smith Falls 12 with rain, and here's what's making news this hour. Monday may be a better test of the LRT since it was restarted this morning. Councillor Tim Tierney rode the rails this morning getting to work and says with the number of people likely taking today off after Remembrance Day yesterday, it may not be the best day to judge. But Tierney didn't see any problems, anything that concerned him this morning. Councillor Jeff Leeper also on the LRT and tweeting he saw an Alstom worker on his train just keeping an eye out. COVID cases on the rise. Today, the science panel in Ontario advising the province will have an update on the projected numbers it feels will happen over the coming weeks. Yesterday, the province was over 600 cases for a single day for the first time in over a month. The daily average of new cases now well over 500 in Ontario. Global Affairs Canada is temporarily withdrawing non-essential staff from the Canadian Embassy in Haiti. The move comes in response to a spike in gang-related violence in that island nation and a severe lack of fuel that has affected hospitals, schools and banks. City News Time 933. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Still ahead on the program, post media columnist and author working on a new book right now. To ask him about books now that we're past Remembrance Day and uh, how it's looking for the uh, local authors for a uh, book selling season coming up for Christmas. Randall Denley is just ahead. It's 934 here on the Rob Snow Show on City News. Welcoming back the host of Daytime Ottawa on Rogers Television. You've heard him all week here on City News Ottawa filling in for Sam LaPrade, uh, Derek Fage. Great in the studio, here. in Great the studio. To be here. I, t- I always tell you, Rob, it's hard following up Lowell. My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Wound up like yeah, a top, that yeah, guy. You just wind him up and let him go. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in the paper uh, today, there's, uh, I guess, the citizens doing this series now, uh, kind of a retrospective of, um, where is it here? A9. 
um, of Jim Watson and his political career. Uh-huh. Thir- what, 30 years now? 30 years today. Uh, Watson's way. Watson's way. And uh, it talks about how he had had this job on Parliament Hill. Yeah. Working for the Speaker. And he bought a house. I believe it. that was, if I remember, it was down Ottawa in, South, in, in wasn't old it? Ottawa South. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, not far from Carleton University, uh, not off of one of those little streets off of Sunnyside Avenue. Beautiful and, area, nice uh, area, town. What motivated him to get into politics was how shocked he was by the property tax bill. <laughs> Which is quite ironic, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> and that's what motivated him to run for, uh-huh. for city council, and he was elected as a ward councillor for Capital Ward mm-hmm. at the time. And it was uh, yeah. wasn't it was a it was an upset, wasn't it, at the time? Yeah, it was a yeah. giant killer. He took down a very popular uh, yeah. councillor at the time, and uh, he's never looked back. Right, he's never looked back. He went on to become mayor, of course, this uh, pre-amalgamated city, and then amalgamation was happening, and he didn't run. Yep. Uh, against Bob Shirelli at that time, uh, left come in, full circle. Yeah, he right. left to do pr- the provincial affairs thing, and uh, in between there was the Ottawa Tourism Commission gig, and then came back was wooed to come back. This says after he had lunch with Jim Durrell, and Jim Durrell can Jim also... Jim uh, wooed him back. Wooed him back, yeah. A former oh. Ottawa mayor as well, Jim Durrell, of course. And um, <laughs> said, the city needs you. The city needs you. Um, Does the city still need I don't know what that says Jim? about what Larry. Do I don't know what, <laughs> what that says about Larry, that Jim is, uh, you know... Jim and Jim are meeting, and they're talking about Larry, and Jim is convincing Jim to uh, come back and save the city from Larry, but nevertheless. Well, I'm not um, sure Larry would have been winning regardless of who was You know what? By that time, I mean, I know Larry O'Brien ran again, but I don't know if his heart was really into it anyway. I think by that time. I like Larry the person, but uh, as a mayor, I... Uh, well, I think he, I think that's what Larry would say. I think <laughs> yeah, you know, he's pretty honest with yeah, about it. Honest. Yeah, he's no, honest. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, 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 true. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of been there, done that. And yeah. I gave it my all, and you know they gave him a rough ride. He didn't have a cooperative council, Larry O'Brien. No, not at all. Right? But I mean so. the way he ran council, and he, I mean he, well, was, he, he didn't he, run council. That was the problem. Well, council that was ran it. Well, him. He tried right. to be. He tried to be a CEO of council. And yeah. it doesn't necessarily work in yeah. the municipal world as it does the business world, yeah. right? Yeah. And the ATU winter bus strike uh, yeah, didn't help. So anyway, um, I wanted to ask you, though, because we've talked about Mayor Watson, and he's going to be very much in focus for the next kind of six weeks because he's mulling it over in his yeah. political future. And what is he going to do? And light rail's not going well. And um, I have never, and I've, racked my brain to think if it's been 30 years of Jim Watson in politics, I can't ever remember him losing an election. He, <laughs> no, I like he either. has this yeah. sense of timing, right? Knowing when to hold him, fold him and everything else. Right. right? So I think if, if he senses that he even has a chance of losing, I don't think he's going to run. I, I, I tend to agree with right? that. Yeah. But 30 years of a politician is a long time. Um, and I think if he runs, I still consider him by far the front runner. Agreed. Um, yeah, I think so. Which is a testament to his skill and success as a politician. What do you think makes him so successful? <laughs> you know, it's interesting, that question, because, uh, you know, when you look at this day and age of social media and, you know, you know, I'm about to tell everybody that I think he's a good leader and I think he's got great leadership skills and people are going to go nuts on Twitter and probably say, Derek, you're a fool. But he is. He, he's got a lot of great qualities when it when it comes to leadership. And I think people forget, you know, his job as mayor is really to get people on board to his vision. I mean, that's the whole idea. Right. And uh, when you look at voting, I, I know there's a lot of division right now on, on city council. And, and it's mainly because of the LRT and the ju- judicial inquiry. We're looking at, you know, the police services budget and things like that have divided council. However, if you look at the voting over the years, there's not that much division. I mean, people have voted, you know, for the most part, for some of the major projects that have been done under Jim's rule. Most people have voted, even the uh, people that aren't on Team Watson, yeah. right? The Watson they, they, Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah the Watson yeah. Club. Yeah. Um, I think Jim has, has this amount of, of charm. I think he's got great wit. He's very funny. Uh, he's self-deprecating. Uh, which I think people yeah, appreciate yeah, yeah. when it comes to humor. Uh, he's got this, 
you know, sarcasm that isn't necessarily incredibly cutting sarcasm. I, I you know, I think it's kind of a gentle sarcasm that 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 works for him. And I, you know, he's passionate, and he's made this his life. You know, I, I think about when I first well, yeah, started. He even admits in the right? piece here in the paper today, I have no life. Politics is my life. This job is my life. However, yes, but yeah, part of yeah. that, part of that politics being his whole life is his his social life, right? And Jim loves people. I, I, I yeah. nobody can deny that. Jim loves being around people, and I know people can say, "Well, yeah, he just wants to get the photograph done and put in the paper, and you know, get to do it on social media and cut the ribbon and everything." No, Jim genuinely, I think, loves to be around people. He gets energy from yeah. people, and I and I think he's got a great first impression with people. You know, when when Jim goes door to door. I give him a lot of credit because, as I said, with, with social media, I can't imagine the, I mean, I've seen the amount of hate thrown his way and, of course, sure. other members of council. Yeah. And everyone's going to everyone's going to snap every once in a while, Rob, when, when it gets piled on you over and over again like that. I, 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 think, I think he's got great leadership skills. Yeah. Another point that's uh, brought up in this, um, one, of the, one of the complaints about any politician is that you only see them at election time. And one of the jokes about Jim is he would attend the opening of an envelope. But, but, <laughs> yeah, and he right, would. Right? He would yeah. attend the opening of an envelope is the old Jim Watson line. Uh, but actually, kind of people appreciate that, that he's not one of these people you only see every four years, that he is everywhere. What's the key to Jim Watson's success? He's met everyone. Yeah. Absolutely. Everyone. Very approachable. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, they I've had to add a second deputy mayor because <laughs> he couldn't go to all yeah. of the events. Like, yeah. It's like hundreds and hundreds of events. Yeah. But I okay. agree with you. I think if he if he looks at this situation coming up and he sees that uh, there's a possibility that he's not going to, to win the next election, I, I think he'll yeah. step away. And good for him. I mean, he's put in a... He's put in oh, his, his 30 long, years. longest right. serving mayor in yeah. Ottawa's history, right? Um, he turned 60 this year. So um, I don't know. I, I don't know. We'll see what because happens. It's, it's, it's going to be fascinating. His life. Because, because he admits politics is his life, yeah. I think he's running again. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. So um, it'll be interesting because his decision shapes the entire campaign. Oh, absolutely. If he doesn't run, then all kinds of people are going to run. It'll make it interesting right. for people like you and I, yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be. So, Jim, don't run. So what do we have? Give uh, us some... About three minutes. Okay. okay, a couple of things here. All right. Um, light rail. Do, do you, if Ford, do you think he would call an inquiry or what? Uh, well, I think... Doug loves to flip-flop, so <laughs> there's a good chance. I know yeah. Doug said, well, you know what? I want to leave that to the municipality. It's an Ottawa That's thing. Yeah, yeah, it's an Ottawa thing. We want to stay out of it. Uh, you know, with, with the amount of money they put in, six hundred billion now, another one point two billion coming up. He's threatened with a letter to, to you know, hold back sixty million bucks. Why not? And quite frankly, uh, please do. Like, save us all the trouble here and just do the inquiry. We had Joel Harden, NDP MPP, on on Sam's show earlier on in the week, and he said, "Listen, if 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 the provincial auditor gets involved, everything is public, and we'll all know what happened, and and we'll be done with the whole issue." And it'll probably be done quicker than the Auditor General here in Ottawa. Quite okay, frankly. here's here's what, here's what I mean, I'm just going to throw this up because our t- Friday free for all talkback hour is coming up too after the ten o'clock news. So maybe uh, listeners with some dump truck driving experience can explain <laughs> this to me yeah. as well, because I'm still struggling to understand this: how somebody can dr- drive a dump truck down the Queensway with with. Well, what do you call it? I don't know, the hydraulic up of, of some What's kind, it? but... I, the bed. The bed. The bed the, the of the... Truck. Yeah, thank you, David. That's why um, you pay David the over bed. there. A minimal salary, but still you pay him. The bed. Good. How do you drive down the Queensway with know. the bed of the dump truck up to the extent when it slams into the overpass? Where's the fail-safe? Because this isn't the like first time it, we've seen this, right? We, we've seen it happen before, know, not necessarily but, here in Ottawa. Do you not but look in the rearview mirror? And apparently yeah. people are honking well, at them. I guess them they and, don't have a rearview mirror, right? Those those types of trucks. I don't think they, they have, have one. They only have the side mirrors. But you think you'd look you'd, in the side mirror, you'd still see it. People are honking horns and everything else. Um, he just thinks they want them to toot the horn maybe when they're honking their horns. I don't know how it happens. Like where is, could you accidentally press the uh, how do you how do you raise the bed? Uh, is there is there, there a button on the, on on the dash? Yeah, or, uh, yeah. I wonder where could you accidentally? Isn't it noisy? Could like, you do you it by accident? Sh- like, wouldn't you hear it unless he's blasting, you know, Guns and Roses or something, and he, he doesn't hear it going up? I don't know. Because that was a nightmare the other day on the Queen. Thank God no one was behind him. Yeah. I mean, you imagine that thing falls off and 
you know, a typical Ottawa tailgater. I just don't know it? how it like, happens. Uh, it's just I, I absolute le- neglect. Bizarre. It's just neglect. Like, yeah. It scares Maybe the guy me that was people... on his way to do some LRT maintenance, <laughs> speaking of neglect. <laughs> <laughs> coming to help us out here in Ottawa. It scares me that that's <laughs> some of the people who are driving on the Queensway. Not just driving on the Queensway, but driving heavy equipment on the Queensway. Yeah. That is a, a frightening thing. All right, Derek, good to see you. You're back in at noon today. I am. All back right. in for Sam LaPrade. Looking Last forward day. to it. All right. This is the Rob Snow Show. Randall Denley's coming up next on City News. <laughs> We just took over this business about a few weeks prior to the pandemic, but we've been loving the community, the people, very friendly, Um, but it's been very difficult starting up a new business, just the time that we did, but I'm sure it's the same everywhere. We did take a broken business, which doesn't help us, but uh, we thought we just, we believe in what we do. We're very passionate about food, and we just really wanted to share the Iraqi culture through our food. All our recipes are homemade, so this is very unique. Usually you hear restaurants, shops, it's all frozen food or prepared food. So nothing here is prepared, everything is homemade. We get our meat and produce from a local farm. So supporting local is the way to go. We are supporting all the way Um, and our meat are actually marinated the day of so it's as fresh as can be quality ingredients and everything is made from scratch I get a lot of people when they come in they say it tastes like Middle Eastern like back home so for you to have been to Iraq and have the food there you can really like compare and see the similarity. We do like to focus on healthy. So our recipes, not only the homemade, again, everything is from scratch, but we have like from combos and to, to like small sandwiches. Our, our, one of our favorites and a lot very popular is the chicken salad and the beef salad. So now you're getting all the protein and all these amazing ingredients that we all need. During this time, I find a lot of people are sitting at home and not enough movement. So to come here and get something healthy, healthy other than go elsewhere and just put, you know, what's not so good for our bodies makes a huge difference. So we have shawarma sandwiches, combos. I mean, if you're looking for a meal to feed your family, I would highly recommend the family platter. It comes literally with everything, with potatoes, um, with rice, with chicken, with beef, um, and we don't charge extra for mix. I know a lot of places do. Here we just add everything to your platter. And lots of healthy choices for sure. We're very passionate about food, and for our small family business, it's, it's been good. Like I said, it's a little struggle, um, but we are not a chained restaurant. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Welcoming back Post Media columnist and author Randall Denley. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, it's great to hear from you. Uh, we're going to talk about back to work uh, and what it means for downtown. Now, there is a, a story in the paper the, this morning about how things are kind of taking shape. But Mona Fortier, the new uh, president of the Treasury Board, says there's no one-size-fits-all solution. And uh, as the paper points out, no dates are mentioned. Now, you wrote in The Citizen this week, in your column that this is a uh, kind of a really uh i would say i guess neglected i guess would be the word there just seems to be a lack of action from local officials on 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 pressing their their federal cousins for some answers um randall right uh, yes yeah, I, yeah. I think it's a huge deal rob and the yeah. communication from mona Forte yesterday which i have to say was one of the most impenetrable pieces of political communication i have ever seen 
it does not offer any encouragement as far as I'm concerned. Okay, Health Canada has provided some guidelines for people going back to work in the office. Well, didn't say how many or when or and in fact as a political leader it seems on this that Forte is just delegating it down to the public service. Well, department by department, you people decide what you want to do, not something she's really going to get engaged with. But I mean the woman represents a downtown Ottawa riding. Yeah. How does she not know how important this is to our city? If we don't get big numbers of public servants back downtown, not only does the downtown become a ghost town, but it, it completely cripples the whole purpose of the LRT. We got this, you know, super expensive multi-billion-dollar train set being built, and some, you know, sometimes occasionally running. And the whole point of it, really, the biggest point, is to move people in uh, downtown if we didn't have the need at the time to get so many public servants into the core we would never have done this so now we're doing it with a lot of local taxpayers money in it and the government's kind of iffy on "Uh, well we'll see you know some will work downtown we don't know it's not really up to us as political leaders i mean the people who are responsible are uh, you know the the bureaucrats around these departments They'll decide, not for us to say. I thought it was an exceptionally weak response. It ought to be very worrying to Ottawa. And and at the same time, you can certainly make a good case for people working from home and all of that. But looked at narrowly, which I think Ottawa leaders need to do at this point, really bad for the city. Yeah, I, I mean, you look at the climate mission that Mr. Trudeau is on right now, um... You know, people working from home would seem to fit right into that. Uh, earlier in the week, we talked about uh, with a commercial real estate broker how the the deputy minister in charge of the real estate portfolio for the for the federal government was outlining his plans a few weeks ago, talking about a at least a thirty percent reduction in square footage um, for office space for the federal government nationwide. And uh, as you say, why have people in cars or on buses or on light rail trains at all, emitting anything at all, right, Uh, if you don't have to? It it would have been a spectacular idea prior to the LRT. Yes. For years, I've been saying we need to distribute jobs around the city so not everyone has to come downtown every day. It's not like, you know, 1910, everybody has to come downtown to work. But nevertheless, the government seemed pretty wedded to that idea, although they have distributed some jobs, of course, to places where the LRT doesn't go, but there's just been a disconnect on this whole public transit thing here between the federal government and the city for years, even though the federal government is putting a lot of money into public transit, but it's like they don't don't see how that affects them, or how does it connect to them? You know, they got 145,000 employees here that used to have to move around every day. Yeah. Now a lot of them might not. Yeah, yeah. Some of the decisions that have been made recently with the federal workforce, I mean, for how long has it been known as CFB Orleans? Um, all of these people working for the military, working for the Mounties, um, <laughs> living in Orleans. They put the new uh, RCMP headquarters out in Barhaven in the old JDS building, and they put DND out on March Road in Canada. Like it's just. Some of yeah, these decisions it, that are made are ridiculous, but anyway. Yeah, at least one of those should have gone in in the Orleans area yeah, somewhere. Yeah, I yeah. guess they got, you know, well, they thought they got a deal. On, yeah, they got a deal, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell of a deal on the defense building. Eh? All they had to do was, like, strip everything to the walls to get rid of the bugs yeah, and so forth yeah, after yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, So I have to ask you, as a longtime columnist uh, for the Ottawa Citizen covering uh, exclusively City Hall, what you thought of this leak <laughs> uh, Bob Shirelli leaks it to Joanne Chianello, um, formerly of the Citizen, now with CBC News, an email from Brian Guest, and uh, who is like a serious insider at City Hall. And uh, in it, it's all about like, like if you, there's a judicial inquiry, you're, uh, you're going to screw me. What do you <laughs> what do you think about that, Randall? I, I guess the moral of the story is if you think Bob Shirelli's your friend, he's not. Yeah. Bob Shirelli's Bob Shirelli's friend, I think. I, I'm not sure what Bob's agenda is. Exactly, he did float out that idea that maybe I'll run for mayor. Maybe he will. I don't know. But he's been 
certainly seeing things in the last several months that are critical of this council, critical of Watson. It's like he's setting the table to say, well, look, you know, we need to step in and fix this, and uh, who better than me? And I think that's part of what they see. Is he wasn't really banging the d- drum for judicial inquiry, I don't think, but to the extent that he didn't condemn it, his, his uh, former friend Brian Guest was upset. And actually, if you read Guest's email, I think he's right on the substance of it. I don't think that there's a lot to be... That it's about destabil- destabilizing things and P3 funding models and this sort of... Yeah, here's the point, Bob, I think that people are missing on all this, especially the people on council say, oh, this P3 private sector thing is terrible. The city should be looking after this themselves. Well, yeah, because the city's so good at everything, and especially, you know, rail maintenance, one of their specialties. And I'll tell you what would happen if the city was doing the maintenance. Instead of councillors and the mayor talking about how terrible this problem is and someone must be held to account, they'd be defending the job their own staff were doing. Well, there have been a few issues, but, you know, excellent people were working on it. It's, it's just natural. And whatever costs were incurred, and they're substantial, that would just blow back on the taxpayer. So the good thing about the P3, and one of the reasons you have it, is because if your private sector partner doesn't do the job, you've got some recourse to say, no, wait a minute, you're contracted to do a job at a certain level. You're not doing it, so we're not going to pay you. We're going to penalize you. The city can't penalize itself, obviously. So I think it was the right thing to do, whether it's the right company, questionable. Obviously, they haven't done as good a job as they should. Part of the maintenance issue is at the right train set. That's debatable, too. Yeah, yeah. So there's certainly issues there. I don't think a judicial inquiry is going to produce okay, any particular so, so, new so insight. What, what to make, then, of uh, the, the, the Ford's change in, in tone about uh, the problems with light rail in Ottawa? What's behind that, then? Well, I think it's the right thing to do. I mean, the problem okay. is putting a lot of money into this. And if you're sitting there in Toronto and now looking at this train you invested in that you want to point to, because they're big on transit now, you know, four, they're spending like three times as much on transit yep. as they are on roads. So they're big on it. So here they're putting all this money into what we have already and then the new one. And you look at the city and you think, wow, it's not even running. Like, do people have any idea what you're doing? So you can see why they would be concerned and asking questions. And I think that's appropriate for the provincial government to do that because whenever city council says, no, 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 we we don't want to dig deeper, even if it's the right thing to do, maybe it won't produce anything. I think they're right about that. But it still looks like we don't want you people to know what really happened. And there's been enough secrecy around this whole thing and the contract and really who's supposed to do what that it creates a feeling in the public that they do have something to hide. And when they say, no, we don't, we don't want anybody to look at this except our own person, it just feeds that perception. So I think the province is playing the right role here. Okay. Are you going to have a book on sale for the Christmas season, Randall? Or Well, I'm probably going to have an opportunity, uh, Rob, to talk to readers about my book, Payback, which was uh, nominated for Crime Warriors of Canada Award. Oh, congratulations. Everything's been pretty much cancelled, as you know, and, and all these kind of things for a year and a half, but I am at the uh, Signature Christmas Show at the EY Centre in the middle of December. I'll have the book there. It's the first time I'm going to have a chance to uh, meet readers and sign the book for them, so that's excellent. Uh, excellent. That's good, and I have another book coming out in April, the next in one April. of the Redner series. All right, excellent. In the Chris Redner series. Yes. Excellent. Look forward to it, Randall. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Yep, talk soon. Randall Denley, author and post-media columnist. This is the Rob Snow Show. Friday, free-for-all, talk-back hour. Love to hear from you. It's wide open on topics at 750-1310 here on City News.
W1310 AM in Ottawa and CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, November 12th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now, raining in the region, Ottawa, 9 degrees. Smith Falls, 12. Here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. A couple of councillors rode the rails in Ottawa this morning for the first time in almost two months. Jeff Leeper and Tim Tierney took the LRT from opposite ends of the line, meeting up at Rideau and comparing notes on their way to work at City Hall. Tierney tells City News this morning that it may not have been the busiest test for the seven trains that are back on the line. Uh, lots of people were smiling and um, under their masks, of course, uh, but uh, you could really sense that people are happy to shave off that 15 to 20 minutes that they would typically have to endure every day. And he's talking about the trip in from the east end being faster by train. Tierney feels Monday will be the better true test after some people likely took off today since Remembrance Day was a federal stat yesterday. City News time 10.02 and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. The wet weather will move out. We'll have some clearing today. Brisk wind, the high near 12 degrees. It'll be mainly clear this evening. A few showers return though overnight, 3 degrees for the low. And for the weekend, cooler air, some showers and possibly some flurries as well, especially for Sunday, highs near 7. For today, the high 12. And right now, raining in the region, 9 degrees in Ottawa, it's 12 in Smith Falls. The science table in the province, the latest pandemic modeling update, is going to be released at 11 o'clock this morning. It is not expected to be as positive as some recent versions. Kevin Meisner joins us from Queen's Park, setting the scene a day after we hit the province's highest daily COVID case count in over a month. We are seeing signs of infection growth in Ontario. 642 new cases reported yesterday. That's the highest level seen since October the 9th. On the positive side, hospitalizations and the number of patients in ICU remains low. However, this week, head of the science table, Dr. Peter Uni, told City News that could change because the province is currently seeing a doubling time of cases of around two and a half weeks. When you start to be in exponential growth, you continue to be on a track where eventually um, hospital and ICU beds will follow. The province's deadline for long-term care staff to have their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine is Monday. The CBC reports 98% of staff have done that. They're required to be fully vaccinated by December 13th. At Queen's Park, Kevin Meisner, City News. City News time at 10.03. Negotiators at this year's UN climate talks in Glasgow appear to be backing away from a call to end all use of coal and phase out fossil fuel subsidies completely. They are giving poor countries hope, though, for more financial support to cope with global warming. Swedish climate campaigner Greta Thunberg is expecting the conference to go into overtime, but is still concerned about the outcome. I really think that it will be uh, delayed. Uh, it always gets delayed. And uh, so um, my expectations are, is that I expect it to be delayed. Um, I don't know if I should say that I'm worried, but of course it doesn't look very promising right now. Now countries like Australia and India, the world's third biggest emitter, have resisted calls to phase out coal anytime soon. A deadly crash being reported in the township of Madawaska Valley. It was around 1 o'clock yesterday afternoon. A car crashed into a tree on Colas Road. The driver and lone occupant of the vehicle was pronounced dead at the scene. That person's name has not been released. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. It's time to talk back. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Friday, free for all. Our favorite hour of the week around here. We don't come up with the topics. You come up with the topics. We roll with it. We usually end up talking about things that have been in the news because this is a, a, like a news talk show. And most people are listening because they're interested in the news. Uh, but it's not carved in stone or anything. It doesn't have to be in the news. Maybe it's something you think should be in the news, whatever your topic happens to be, within reason. Uh, we're usually wide open to talking about just about anything. 750 Let's get right down to it. Ian. Good morning, Ian. Good morning, Rob. Morning, sir. 
Yeah. The Alstom Cytata Spirit Train. I That's tell it. you, whether you go on the manufacturer's site, some of my locomotive forums or LRT forums, or you want to call them, yep. um, there's not a whole lot. Now, bear in mind that this is a very, very new model of train, so you're not going to find as much as you'd like to find on it. But uh, credit to the Ottawa citizen, Mr. John Willing. Um, learned a lot out of this uh, a lot out of this um, uh, news piece he put through here. Now, anyway, going back to what I was saying last week about big mud tires on a truck, you know, uh, the slower it goes, the more vibration you feel. Uh, very simple science. Steel wheels on steel rails. There's not a whole lot of cushion for that energy absorption, except for, you know, obviously, your, your, your spring system and, and suspension components on the train, which still isn't a whole heck of a lot. Now, moving forward. I'm going to take back what I said last Friday because there was only 12 people on this train at the time. Now, where they were located on the train, uh, none of us obviously know. However, when I scroll down in this wonderful little news article from uh, the Ottawa Citizen, not only does it uh, tell us that the, the tracks of the car left the rail while it was at the platform, so that's concerning. Yes. Um, uh, then we factor in a, a speed limit of 35 kilometers an hour that was um, being held before it derailed and after it derailed. Now, all this is uh, jibber-jabber until we look at an image. Now, on this image, we can see that the train left the track to the point where it damaged the actual platform. And this is the platform that people are staring at their phones while standing in front of waiting for the doors to open to get in. It's then now shifted the actual railway ties. Now, these aren't wooden ties that we use for LRT. I believe they're concrete or, or some type of uh, much harder material. It literally shifted the ties forward, okay? And aside from all that, going back to steel on steel, you're going to feel everything. For, for those who haven't been on a train before, very same, you know, four or five consistent noises you hear from the beginning of your trip to the end of your trip. How that train to leave a station at and, and approach a speed of 35 kilometers an hour while a steel wheel is bouncing over the odd railroad tie, dragging against the side of a concrete platform, and to put it all in conclusion, or, or to top it all off, dragging the ballast. Now, ballast is the type of aggregate stone that they use all around the, uh, the actual yeah. ties itself. Yeah. To conclude, Rob, I wish, I wish I could have found out more, but I do believe that this kind of just comes down to, now I'm not calling anybody who takes the LRT stupid because there's no stupidity here, but there is <laughs> okay. some plain Jane ignorance. Now, on any single train that you run in that, 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 that carries people around, to, to wrap this up here, there's an emergency stop button. It's usually either yellow or red um, inside the, the cab of the cockpit where uh, the, the, the train operator uh, sits. I watched a 25-minute video on how they train those guys in on when I got to see the cockpit of the unit. He has a safety button. He's got to continuously hit to, to say that the train, he's still there, he's still alive. What I would advise anybody from here on out, should anybody decide to get on one of those seven trains today, I'm sure you don't want to, but you need to because you got to get places. <laughs> Put your phone away. Look around a little more and open up those ears because your ears are going to tell you how safe you're on a okay. train pretty quick. There is no way that this this all comes down to lack of lack of lack of installation is what I got to okay. leave. I mean, so you do, you're not just a transit rider now; you have to be a vigilant. Yes, you need to help those guys rider. do okay. their job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. See something. Say something. See something. Say something. <laughs> Holy cow. That's where we're at, I guess. In South Keys, Dan, you're on City News, Friday Free For All Talk Back Hour. Good morning. Hey there, Rob. Hey. Um, so I've had the privilege of turning 65. Congratulations. Uh, in September. Yep. Yeah, and you know what? A lot of my friends didn't make it that far, so I am privileged. Okay, good for you, However, sir. However, yep. I do have a beef. Do you know what the old age uh, pension is? How much it is a month? No. <laughs> $635. Oh, $635. Wow. Now, you you take somebody working 15 hours uh, a day, or sorry, $15, $15 an, hour. an hour. Yeah, yeah. sorry about that. Yeah. And that works out in a month's wages at $2,400. That's what they will get if they're doing 40 hours a week, roughly, okay? Yeah, gross, I'm getting, right? Gross, you, gross, right? Gross. Yeah, gross. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Now, the old age pension check I get. Yeah. Let's say I turn that into a job. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm working. Uh, I'm getting 600. Do you know how many, how much that is an hour? What does that work out to be? $3 and 96 cents. $3 and 96 cents. Holy cow. Wow. Yeah. 
So how do they, governments are throwing money around like drunken sailors right yep. now. Yep. How do they expect, I, I dare anybody to try and survive on that amount. Well, you can't survive on that amount. No. Right. So really, and so that, 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 that is why I'm just saying that that's why in theory they have the two other programs, the old age security program and the guaranteed income supplement for the poorest seniors, right? So, yeah, but yeah. Uh, see, well, the bonus is I, I'm, I'm withdrawing my um, uh, CPP, but that brings my salary up that I might not even qualify for right. Well, yeah, yeah, plus OAS in the end, I, from yeah. what I'm told, is almost like it's next to nothing almost, right? So, well, yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Well, yeah. And these seniors will vote the Liberals back in again. Well, what's the matter with you people? Sorry, I'm a little bit upset. <laughs> no, 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 I understand it. But you did the math, like, let's say, you know, your 600 and some odd dollars a month works out to, for 40 hours a week, if you if it was 40 hours a week of labor, be $3 and... 96 cents. 96 cents an hour. Yep. Wow. Well, maybe 97 with the points, but yeah. anyway. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever, yeah, Holy yeah, yeah. smokes, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. That's the well, point. you know, this is, maybe this is another case of, you know, maybe it's time to explore, um, you know, guaranteed income or something like that. Well, right? yeah. It, what, what can I buy for $635 a month? I mean, yeah, it's going up uh, first of January, maybe it has gone up. They, they boost it like 2% or something like that. Come yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Dan, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, you know, maybe that prompts another discussion about basic income and, you know, in a wealthy country like Canada, how can you ever expect and why should we ever expect somebody to try and live on that kind of monthly income? Uh, Garvin, Nepean, Nepean, a wonderful place to be in. Garvin. Good morning, Rob. Morning. Uh, thank you for taking my call. A pleasure. Uh, I'd like to speak about the issue of uh, the raising and lowering of flags to okay. the different uh, concerns. Yeah, yeah. The international sign for distress is to fly the flag upside down to show that you need assistance. Okay, I didn't and know that. And we all need assistance right now, and uh, I think uh, it would be a startling uh, display to uh, to get everyone's attention. So You want to flag the, fly the flag upside down? Yes. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah. What do you need help from? Uh, uh, <laughs> what has us in distress? What has well, you in distress, Garvin? Uh, let's start with, uh, we have uh, the climate, Climate, uh, the economy, okay. yeah, our health, yes, our, our local infrastructure, okay, um, the the trains being one of that, mm -hmm. um, and just uh, it's always good to assist other people to make sure that everyone's doing well. Sure, sure. Okay. Anyway, have a good Friday. And well, I thank you, Garvin. To, uh, thank you. Okay, yep, you did, and it's done. Ten fourteen, Rob Snow Show Talk Back Hour. Lines available. Have your say. Vent. Yell at me, say nice things about me. It doesn't matter what it is, just spell my name right. This is the Rob Snow Show Talk Back Hour on City News. I always knew I was going to own my own business, um, and I've always wanted to have a store. Um, and I sort of figured when the right concept came together at the right time, I would move forward with that plan. And so through uh, doing some environmental initiatives in the restaurant group that I was with prior to opening this store, it just triggered my path towards being more environmentally conscientious and wanting to make more of a difference and hopefully encouraging, inspiring other people to want to do the same, at which point the idea for All Eco was born. I have some really fine products. I have a really wide spectrum of products. So the things we look for in terms of qualifying products are uh, sustainably made, um, upcycled, recycled, zero waste, um, all natural, no harmful chemicals to like the environment or to our bodies. Uh, we have like fun stuff, so like really clean burning candles lots of really um, natural body care and skin care. I put a real emphasis on Canadian products. Um, I really try to support up and comers and uh, I, always, I always source Canada first. The refill bar is really important to me. It's really huge, I think. Um, that's been exciting as well because I thought it was going to be 
a real process in convincing people that this is a better way to to go and actually it was just like right away there was a built-in um, affinity towards doing refill which has been great we closed I think probably we were closed down by before the second week of March just didn't feel we could comfortably or confidently stay open even though I do sell essential products like with in terms of the cleaning um, but we just didn't feel we could make a safe space for ourselves or our customers at that time and especially with the information we had at the time so we did close our doors at which point I did not have a website because that was only I hadn't even scheduled myself to have a website at that point so that was sort of like full speed moving towards that and trying to drive the business at the same time still get myself on the map because I was so new um, so during that time, as we were building um, the website, we were still doing a lot of video shopping and private shopping, online shopping, or sorry, like online phone, text, any way I could do business, I was doing it. And there was really a nice show of support for my business during that time, which was really, really encouraging. Um, and now, you know, we, we are fully set up online too. Back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. It's a Friday free-for-all talk back hour. Uh, Rob is in Munster. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Rob. How are you? Hanging in there, buddy. Counting down the hours till the weekend, you know? Well, I can. I think I can help you out with your dump truck question. Yeah, I just want to know because uh, I was caught in that because I I'm off at noon and then I head westbound on the Queensway from Walkley to get to downtown. So I was stuck right in the middle of that. It was not. Um, it was not pleasant. And then all the side routes were all backed up as well. All because some guys it, 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 driving down the Queensway apparently, unbeknownst to him, the bed on his dump truck is up and it slams right into a, an overpass. How does something like that happen? Well, there's two ways. As I was explaining to David, there's two ways that this could have happened. When he dumped his load from wherever he was dumping from, and I'm guessing LRT construction. When he dumped his load and he lowered his box, he forgot to lock his PTO or power takeoff, okay. which is what raises and lowers the box. So probably what happened, he forgot to do that. And so he thinks his box is down. He's driving down the road, and then the wind starts to catch it. It's not locked. All of a sudden, it just starts to raise up, raise up, raise up. And then what happens is you wouldn't actually notice that in your side mirrors unless you were looking for it. And then all of a sudden, he hits the bridge. Holy cow. Holy cow. So that's what happened in the one that happened about almost a year ago now in front of the Canadian Tire Center. So the fella, he forgot to lock his PTO. And that, I can see that happening. There's like a checklist, like an airplane that you should go through. Oh, really? Every, okay. Every time you raise and lower your box, there's like a checklist you should go through. When it's lowered, have I locked my PTO? Have I locked the tailgate? All and where do you lock? I'm sorry, Rob, if I could just interrupt there. Where do you sure. lock it? You or do, do you lock it from inside the cab of the truck, or is that an outside it's all, job? Or uh, it's all it's all automated. All automated. Yeah. Okay. It's just right. a lever. You pull it, and then you push down a thing, and it tells you it's locked. Oh, okay. It has a. It, there's. It's it's foolproof. Well, obviously it's not. No, I don't think it's foolproof. It's <laughs> not foolproof, no. <laughs> but I can see, I can see it happening. Sometimes guys get in a rush. Or yeah, yeah. It's it, it's got chances are it's driver error. There's no way it's mechanic. Like for that to happen, it has to be an unlocked box. Okay, That's all right. The only way that could happen. Yeah. What do you think is going to happen to that guy? You think he's driving a dump truck today, or? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and. You know, depending on whether it was a broker truck or whether it was somebody, I, I don't know the company. What do you mean a broker truck? What does that mean? Well, like a lot of, like, so like on when you're working on the LRT, yeah. if you you may be driving in a, a Kiwit truck, which is the contractor, okay. or a lot of times they hire out dump trucks for about between 90 and 100 bucks an hour. Okay. So it depends, it depends on if it, it might have been his own truck. Ooh. So there he's on the hook. He's on the, he's hook. On the hook for the insurance, the, the repairs, everything else. <laughs> oh, 
I bet you that would cost a lot too to a fix lot, that up. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. And then you've got you know the MT, the ministry is going to investigate. The Ministry of Labor is going to investigate. He could be getting a pile of fines. Could be a lot of things. If oh, it's man. a company truck, yeah. Uh, let's say Kiwit itself. Yeah. I mean, they'll have to absorb all that, and probably that guy will lose his job. Holy cow! Yeah. All for the yeah. sake of not. Locking, lock, lock the box, lock the box, lock, right? Lock the box. All and, right. And double, you know what? I drive quite a bit yeah. for, the, for my nephew. I drive the jump truck a lot. And it's just a matter of just taking that extra three minutes, okay. making sure that everything's buttoned up tight. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Very informative. Thanks. Very informative for walking us through all of that. Isn't that something, eh? Yeah. That's a bad day at work for that guy. That is a bad last day at work. Uh, guy in Ottawa, go ahead. Yes, good morning, Rob. Morning. I've got a quick question. I've never ridden the LRT, but okay. I, on my bicycle downtown, yep. and there's a high-speed bicycle track that runs right along from Herdman right down to the University of Ottawa. Yes, yeah. And yeah. I go by three stations, and they all have spotters. And so where were the spotters? Beforehand, as the train comes in, tearing up the tracks, wouldn't they notice something? Good question, sir. To Very blow good the question. Whistle, saying, "Hey, you got a problem?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good question. Yeah, I don't know where they were, or if they were oh. spotting anything, or if they spotted anything. Well, Obviously, the they didn't. Are right there, and they blow whistles. Everything's clear. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. You know, and one other thing in oh. regards to the guy with the dump truck, poor guy. Yeah. But I wonder if he, what he was doing the night before. Was he out late? I don't know. Mm, you know, maybe. it's yeah, a tough yeah. one. Yeah, because okay. that did happen in the morning, late morning. It happened, exactly. uh, I believe, late you know. morning. Yep, yep. All right. Thank you. Thank one. you, guy. Yep. 750-1310. 750-1310. Anne in Ottawa. Good morning, Anne. Oh, hi there. Oh, hi there. Uh, hi. Um, I have two things that I want to talk about. First of all, that uh, inflammatory email between Bob Shirelli and whoever that other guy was, you're screwing us all over or whatever. But Brian Guest, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that screams to me, you know, having worked in the federal government, who knows, one hand washes the other. Okay, you do this and I'll, I'm going to protect your back. I don't know. I mean, maybe something was pushed forward on this contract by an actual city employee, but maybe they were being kind of told on high to do it. Who, who knows? That kind of stuff happens okay. just for whatever agenda. But the other thing is um, about this climate change, all this craziness, um, which I think is like gross hyperbole. All right. um, you don't I'll think it's one minute to midnight? No. no. I don't. <laughs> okay. And the all thing right. is, um, I listen because you're not on on the weekend. I listen to Roy Green on the weekend. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. yes. 6.40 a.m. He's great, and he has good interviews, just as you do. Um, he had an interview with Dr. Christian Luprecht, and I'm positive you know who that is. He's that guy. He, he uh, is a professor at Royal Military College, but he knows a lot about geopolitics. Okay. His conclusion, and he's got evidentiary support that he's looked into, a lot of this zeal, to it, it's not about carbon emissions it's to decarbonize the western and european democracies so that yeah like china's looking at us oh look at them they're destroying their economies and then not only there's there's only one person sitting in a chair there's no chairs left and china gets to rule the world oh, and if I you see. think about it look what's going on in europe I, I i think there's something to that and i think uh what do you mean look at what's going on in europe what do you mean well uh, with the energy stuff like like they're running out of energy because everyone's saying oh we can't you know do pipelines or, oh, yes, or, this, yes, that, yes. or the other yeah. thing i mean we're right, right around the corner from doing that and mm. i think we need to wake up and smell the coffee. I really do. Um, this is crazy. All right, Ann. Thank okay, you. Bye. Bye bye. Matthew in Gatineau. Good morning, Matthew. Are you're on City News? Good morning, Rob. Hi. So yeah, that driver. He's actually a repeat offender. He's actually always forgetting. He's uh, he does recent drop-offs in out in Almont. Oh really? And, uh, he's always forgetting to lock it down. Oh. The same okay. driver that made the accident at. Uh, at Palladium. I'm sorry, sir. Gone. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The driver who guys broke the dump truck on the riverside. Yeah. Same guy a year ago who did it out at Palladium. Same guy? Same guy. Really? How do you know that? I know the guy. He, he drives out into Almond. He drives, uh, does work for my mechanic as well. 
Okay, okay. All right. Okay. That's all I got to say about that. Okay. Okay. All right. I, you know, I, I guess I'll take your word for it. I don't know, but um, that's that's it. You know, that's an interesting twist to it. I guess if it is um, the same person who did it. Holy cow! Uh, Jeff, is it Jeff? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. On the uh, you're on the Queensway right now, are you? Of course. Okay. I All drive right. a truck. You do. And okay. I'm tired of this Queensway. We need to open up a new highway. I asked you before to start a campaign to. What new highway? highway? What new highway? What new highway? I don't care. <laughs> okay. Just get me a get me a highway. <laughs> okay. I don't like living in this city with one road. Okay. Uh, what do you suggest? Where should this highway go, sir? Uh, Trip Hunt Club of all the traffic lights. Make on and off ramps. There's oh. your highway. Okay. Okay. Easy. Um, like a ring, you know like you want to you want to re- resuscitate conversation about a ring road. Ring road. Yeah. Right. Yeah. On yeah. ring road. Put it around the mayor's head. Well, well, uh, you know what I, uh, I, I think if we, you don't like the Queensway. What I can't believe is, um, I still can't get over. I was happened to be down near the market yesterday. The truck traffic uh, that it, it just is still rumbling every day through the core of our city. Uh, you know, snaking its way down Nicholas on Dorito Street and across that bridge over to Quebec. Um, nope. That is the most ridiculous traffic yeah. thing that's going on in the entire well, city. And for the NCC to say, well, we, we don't even know if a new bridge would solve that. Well, something needs to be done about that because it is way out of hand. You know they have this new program or the, the uh, squid game? Squid game, well, yeah. <laughs> that's our frogger game. People yeah. have to try and cross the street while the big trucks Oh, drive. it's unbelievable. That's the mayor's... Uh, that's the mayor's yeah. uh, he sits on he watches it on his TV there. Yeah, yeah. And I remember... You know, like, uh, I remember the, the the Don't late. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay. The late Maril Belanger. The late Maril Belanger once told me. Uh, he said, "Rob, that crossing for that bridge, King Edward there, uh, is the only crossing between here and Hawkesbury yeah. for hazardous goods. Mm-hmm. For hazardous goods." And that if, say, a truck was carrying ammonia, for example, uh, ever tipped over on King Edward, you'd basically have to evacuate all of downtown Ottawa. Oh, yeah. And they don't believe that. They, they don't see that. And it's going to happen one day. Because uh, I hope not. They close their eyes to things. So yeah. And Maril said, Maril said uh, not only do we need uh, one new bridge, we need two. Yeah. We need one in the we need one in the east end, and we need one another one in the west end as well. Yep, so, exactly. But uh, Bayshore and uh, unfortunately, uh, Marill is no longer with us, sir. So uh, we've lost his common sense. Well, I know. Before I retire, I'm going to tell you they won't even have it then. All they keep doing is putting a bandaid on this friggin' Queensway. Yeah. All right, Jeff. Thank you. All right, Thank you. Yeah, Jeff's on the Queensway, and he's. Not happy about it. Halfway through the talk back hour, Friday free for all. That's kind of how we roll. We just uh, boot various things around, whether they're in the news or not. This is the Rob Snow Show on City Dim.
number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, November 12th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, it's 9 degrees, 11 degrees in Smith Falls, and here's what's making news this hour. The province is reporting 598 new cases of COVID-19 today, the vast majority of them, 376 In people who are not fully vaccinated, 22 of the cases are people who are fully vaccinated. Of the 130 people currently in ICUs across the province due to COVID-19, 121 of them are not fully vaccinated, but nine did receive both shots. A group of scientists advising the Ontario government on COVID-19 will be releasing their latest pandemic modelling numbers this morning. The COVID-19 signs table expected to publish those numbers in about a half an hour at 11. It comes amid a resurgence of COVID-19 cases that has prompted the the province to put further reopening plans that were set for Monday on hold. No trouble reported during the morning rush on the seven LRT trains back on the tracks this morning. A couple of city councillors joined those on board for their daily trip to work. Both Tim Tierney and Jeff Leeper say it was a smooth ride, although not very busy. It was the day after remembrance. Many people seem to have taken the day off. The new city councillor for Canada North is being sworn in today at City Hall. Kathy Curry is about to be one of the guests still coming up on the Rob Snow Show this morning. City News Time, 1033. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. It's time to talk back. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Yes, Kathy Curry spoke to her around 7 o'clock this morning and uh, very impressive. I was very impressed. I think um, people of Canada North will be uh, well served uh, by Kathy Curry. And hear that interview that's coming up right after the 11 o'clock news. Final hour of the Rob Snow Show. This is the second half of the Friday free-for-all talk back hour. So you know how it rolls. Just about anything goes during the Friday free-for-all. I have some topics. You have some topics. Uh, I'd love to hear your topics. But if you don't call, we don't hear you. And that means you have to listen to me. And we'd rather not do that on a Friday. It's 750-1310. Um, another Remembrance Day has come and gone. I'm glad this kind of weather waited one day. I'm glad this wasn't the weather that greeted our veterans yesterday. Uh, for a while there yesterday, I thought today's show was going to be about Justin Trudeau and the Governor General. Uh, and Because it looked like they showed up late to the National Remembrance Day ceremony. We were broadcasting that live yesterday during our show. And um, I didn't know what was going on because that ceremony usually runs with military precision. You know, it starts at this time. And then this happens and then this happens. And it's like right down to the minute, you know. And yet when we joined the national ceremony at 1045, the minutes kept ticking by and our radio airwaves were filled with dead air and nobody on television seemed to be offering any details as to what was going on and uh david and i were sitting here and we were just kind of thinking haven't seen the prime minister yet uh it's five to eleven haven't seen the prime minister yet haven't seen the governor general yet uh there's supposed to be two minutes of silence five minutes from now and then finally the motorcades pulled up And uh, I was probably like a lot of people thinking, is the prime minister late for the Remembrance Day ceremony? Is he late? And then the governor general, is she late? Uh, And uh, nobody can answer that question because it's all unfolding in real time, right? How can you be late for Remembrance Day? I just, uh, I hope this doesn't become the story of the day. That would have been very unfortunate because Remembrance Day is not about Justin Trudeau or Mary Simon, the governor general, for that matter. It's about the veterans and honoring our veterans. And the last thing the country needs is a scandal about Remembrance Day protocol. Uh, So, as you can imagine, during that hour, that sent the media into a frenzy, including our team here at City News. We were working the phones, working our sources, and very quickly, within 30 minutes or so, we had the story. A suspicious package. And that call to 
delay the arrival of the dignitaries was made by the security detail. And that's why they were late. And that's why I don't think it's much of a story now. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness. I have no reason to doubt that. I have no reason to question that. If, if that's the call of the authorities, they were there on the scene. And think of the dignitaries there. Okay. You have the head of state, you have the head of government, the leader of the official opposition, the Speaker of the House, the Speaker of the Senate, um, all kinds of other dignitaries, VIPs, basically the, the major positions in the apparatus of government are there. Okay. So if, if, Precautions are necessary in this kind of threat environment. So be it. So be it. I would just say it would have been nice if someone had alerted the media. You know, whisper something into the the anchor on CBC News or CTV News or CPAC. You know, Psst, here's what's going on. I'm going to be a little late. You know, call 750-1310 and tell Rob what's going on, right? Governor General is going to be a few minutes late and this is why why the governor general had to show up and be announced during the two minutes of silence i don't know um that was kind of sloppy i guess but i uh, i can't ever remember anything like that so i guess you just kind of have to roll with it i don't think it rises to any level of scandal or anything and to talk about it anymore you're just flogging a dead horse unfortunately that it happened but in this day and age you and you just can't be too careful and that's all i really have to say about that uh, Chris in Blackburn Hamlet. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Rob. Morning. Just want to follow up on your conversation with Lowell about um, climate change. Mm -hmm. And I guess the kid's basic question, the question I've been asking for many years is, okay. so how is destroying our natural resources going to help the earth and help climate? I just don't see it. Okay. But, um, you know, what bothers me about this is when you watch the news and you see all these marches around the world, and it's usually young people, you know, between the ages of, you know, 16 and 20 yes and do these young people understand like if they get what they want what they think they want what kind of a world are they going to inherit when they're full-grown adults i mean uh, they won't all be able to drive electric cars and as your um as uh, ian lee said you know we don't have the grid to support everybody driving an electric car right well, now. Well, not yet. So, not yet. Yeah. Not, not yet. yet. I mean, yeah. it's, it's but I mean, who knows what, it, you know what, Chris, who even knows what the technology is going to be like 10 years from now? Right? Oh, well, yeah. We don't know. Nobody knows. It, Nobody knows. Nobody knows. It would right? be wonderful. If I mean, think of the technology 10 years ago, Chris. Think of the technology right. 10. Nobody had Netflix 10 years ago. Exactly. Right? But you have to go one step at a time. You can't, yeah. can't put the cart before the sure, horse. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, I don't know what, these, I think these young people might be uh, leaving themselves down the path. Well, I mean, young regret. people, you know, young people are, are they're, they're, you're supposed to be idealistic and wanting a better world when you're young, right, Chris? That's sure. what young people do. That's what you know, it's maybe not yeah, we, entirely rooted in reality, Chris. If we, uh, we just got to get them to think it through a little bit more and, and listen to people like Ian Lee when they, when they speak, but they're not listening sure, to him, so sure. yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter. Uh, as far as the downtown core, I think that our municipal leaders here in Ottawa should have done a better job of you know, pressing the feds to get people back to work in those buildings. Because mm -hmm. as Randall Denley said, you know, we, we have this LRT, which I was using from the beginning. Yes. It was actually saving me about 10 minutes uh, either way. Oh, really? Back and okay. forth. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I was only late for work once in the two years. It Did was you have coming. to transfer at all or was it pretty direct for you? Uh, um, I would take a bus from the hamlet here to Blair, okay. hop on a train, get off at Plasteville, Plaste and then hop on a bus to Plaste Portage. Oh, okay. So okay. there was a lot of transferring stuff, but it was actually still a bit faster than the uh, previous you know, uh, bus, bus routes. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so it, it saved me a bit of time. I guess the, the, from the downtown core to the east end, that's where you save time because you're not having to go through the downtown traffic. But... Um, well, I, I, the, mayor, uh, the mayor tweeted about an hour ago, took the train to work today, seats on my car were about two-thirds full. My thanks to OC Transpo staff for their work in getting service, albeit partial, service resumed. We have a long way to go to earn back our passengers' trust, but today has been a good first step. So that, the, 
That's and what I the mayor said. Are they still going to have the free rides in December? I, I guess he's looking at that. I think still. they're going to. I, I, once you promise that, can you really take it back? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, bye-bye. Yeah, the biggest local story of the week was, again, light rail. It haunts us still. Lots of developments on that file. City Councilor Transit Commissioner Catherine McKenney finally managed to get a vote on the City Council on the question of the judicial inquiry. The mayor marshaled his forces, voted it down, uh, something they should have done the first time around, but the mayor and his council allies decided to play cutesy uh, with procedure during the council meeting. And uh, you know what they did, really, David, when, when they did that with the replacement motioning, you know, Glenn Gower and the mayor in cahoots? They just gave the story legs. They kept a story that could have been dead. They kept it alive for like a month. It was a gift to us. Yep. Great angle. It was a story for like a month longer than it ever needed to be. Oh, yeah. All because of, you know what? Shenanigans. Shenanigans. 1310 the vote. Okay. The nays take it on holding a public inquiry. I repeat, if you're thinking of running for city council, that's your issue. Tailor made for you. You want to challenge the incumbent in your ward? You think it's time for a change in leadership? Run on that. Look, my challenger voted for this awful light rail system and an even worse maintenance contract and voted against an inquiry that would dig deep and go further than the Auditor General is ever able to go. That's your attack line. Your call to action is this. And you have to ask yourself why my challenger would vote against getting to the bottom of this procurement disaster. What does my challenger have to hide? You stare right into the camera of Rogers Television while you're doing the ward debate and Mark Sutcliffe is, is the moderator. Okay, that's what you do. And you're going to win. You'll win. <laughs> it's a ready-made issue to me. Just a ready-made issue. And I would just say um, to those of you, you know who you are, who voted with the mayor on this one, good luck in defending your position because you're going to have to defend that position during every debate and probably at many, many doors that you knock on. And quite frankly, it smells, okay? It smells. It smells. It has a lingering stench. <laughs> Let's take this line here. Chris in Canada. Chris, you're on City News. Morning, Rob. Morning. Uh, with, all the, with all the negativity out there, I just wanted to say uh, you make my day. I drive uh, the city of Ottawa's. I, uh, as a job, I guess I have a death wish, but you and Derek <laughs> are the best one-two punch I have heard on the waves in a long, long time. Oh, long. thank you, Chris. That's very kind of you. What are you uh, doing out and about uh, dr driving around the city? Uh, parts delivery. Parts delivery. Auto parts, I'm guessing. Is yeah. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are busy, I bet. Uh, especially getting into the winter, uh, we see a lot of body shops to oh, go see. with my death wish on auto. Oh, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I bet. And soon uh, it'll be um, rims and tires, rims and tires, rims and tires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, knee, we're knee deep in that. Uh, two other quick things. Uh, Trudeau for entertainment value, taking selfies on Remembrance Day yes. is, is the top of the cake for that. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier this year that uh, you lost one of your fur babies. I uh, just want to give my sympathies. I lost mine three years ago, and I still have rough days. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. It was a couple of months ago. We, we had a, a Catahoula, which is a hound, uh, the official dog of Louisiana, the state of Louisiana. He was a rescue. He was uh, blind in one eye and completely deaf, and he was still such a... Yes, David, are you talking to me? No? Uh, sorry. And he had... Um, vestibular vestibular disease which is um a problem with the ear that makes them um makes him dizzy so he can't couldn't walk straight it, and uh, suffered from it for about three weeks and by the end had no quality of life whatsoever wouldn't even get out of his bed uh just, the easiest hello and the hardest goodbye yeah it's it's hard to say goodbye to them it's hard to say goodbye to them that's why when you do shows about dogs or pets, everybody has an opinion because, uh, you know, you're talking about members of your family, right, Chris? 
for sure. Yeah. Mine was my child. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chris. Thank Thanks, you. Rob. Yeah, wonderful stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough when you have to say goodbye to your dog. Rodney in Ottawa. You're on City News, Rodney. It's hard to say goodbye to your dog or your cat. Yep, yep. You know, and you know, when I worked for a vet, uh, it was the people coming in with tears. That oh, yes, yes, the, yes, yes. That were signing you worked something. for a vet? Yeah. Oh, you one, did? At one time, I was going to be a vet. Oh, really, Rodney? But My gosh. I worked for some of the worst ones in the city, and... <laughs> Uh, it, actually, it was a very early high school program where you got a week off school and you could go and work for in your industry, your choice type thing. Okay, and, okay, okay. And the vet that I worked for, uh, he made the newspapers in Ottawa and Gatineau oh, really? and okay. Aylmer. Oh. And after one day working with him, I decided I'd rather go back to high school. Okay, you know, all right, all right. Was it. So, but look, what's on your mind today, Rodney? We're running a little short on time here. Okay. It hey, says Remembrance Day. The calling was to thank you for the show yesterday. I thought it was very touching for Remembrance Day show. Oh, thank you, and, Rodney. Yeah. And I'm also going to think of an English lady that phoned into you, oh, two, three, four months ago, and she talked about how with COVID, we're actually fighting an invisible war. Mm. And just on that sort of thought frame, just in memory for all the people that sacrificed, you know, it could have been part of their life or their lives or whatever. Yeah. Uh, hey, now's a good time to do our little bit of commitment, and that's to go the little bit extra for the next little while, you know, wearing a mask. Yeah, you know, wear, you know all the same rules apply. You know, stay six feet apart, wear your mask, wash your hands, all that, all that stuff, Rodney, and uh, look. Get your vaccinations. Uh, that's the way we're going to get out of this. 1048. And by the way, anti-vaxxers, don't crash Remembrance Day ceremonies, you bunch of bozos and jerks like you are out in Kelowna, British Columbia. Awful, awful people. Trying to get people onto your side? Don't crash a Remembrance Day ceremony, you losers. 1045, Rob Snow Show. Be right back, City News. While we're celebrating our 43rd year, it's still family operated. We're in our second generation. We, uh, pre-COVID, we're at about 1,000 employees. We have 20 stores from coast to coast in Canada. Uh, we do our own manufacturing. Uh, we, uh, right here in Ottawa, we have about 160 people that support Canadian-made manufacturing in addition to our retail stores. Taking you back to mid-March and the impact of uh, the pandemic on Lee Valley, Lee Valley was actually in a tough spot. We had just launched our website a few months prior to that, and we were going through you know, a fairly typical deployment dive where your customers retract as they adjust to the website. And then uh, under stress already, this pandemic hit. And uh, in the early days, you know, it was pretty critical. It hit us really hard. Stores were closed. Um, you know, we weren't sure what to do, so we had to go right into survival mode. As a result, uh, you know, we uh, had to take our workforce almost back to half of where we were at because the stores were closed and with 20 stores, that's a, a big retail workforce. Um, but what we were able to do pretty quickly with a little luck being essential, selling tools and hardware, uh, we were able to uh, adjust our business model, uh, you know, with um, respect to the stores and our fulfillment operation. Uh, that new website that we were under stress worked out well for us because as the world was under house arrest, uh, people were looking to online and uh, the conversion uh, to our online sales in some cases almost doubled. And we saw a tremendous interest in uh, things to do at home where we were lucky once again is, uh, and fortunate is that our product offering, you know, work at home tools, craft, hobbies, backyard, container, uh, gardening, you name it, what we sold was really appealing to people. With respect to our stores, uh, Lee Valley, you know, a, a rare unknown fact was that we were one of the pioneers of curbside pickup. We've been doing it for 25 years. Pretty much dove right into uh, the, ap the application to help with the contactless shopping right away. We took the uh, application, and it's not like a, a Apple application where you have to download it to your phone and clutter up your phone. This is literally resides right on our website. So you walk into our store with your phone, you pull up our website, and there's a little scan icon. You just tap that, select your store, off you go, 
You go through the showroom, you scan product, you can read more about it, you can check the on hand, you can add it to your cart, continue to shop, and when you're ready, you just submit it to the counter, we'll go pick it for you, we'll call out your name, we'll check you out, send you on your way. You haven't touched anything, it's completely safe, and it's using a device you're comfortable with and a website that you're familiar with. Amazingly, nine out of 10 people that used it, loved it and want to use it again. Back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. All right, we have about six minutes, seven minutes left here. Talk back hour Friday free for also to try to fit in everybody here. Sam in Orleans here on City News. Sam. Uh, hi, Rob. Hi, Sam. I started here about your dog first. Did we lost ah, no, it's okay. We're so, over it. So yeah. I know what it's like yeah, yeah. Uh, in August. Uh, I just wanted to raise something that nobody is talking about, and it's the fact that none of our political leaders seem to be thinking about poor foreign policy. Okay. At a time when China is getting ex ex exceedingly muscular in terms of its, uh, of its, uh, its, its foreign policy, when Russia is becoming more assertive, and frankly, the United States is becoming a bit of a wild card, increasingly isolationist, uh, clamping down on our uh, economy by, you know, threatening Line 5 in Michigan, not allowing a hydro line to remain. Um, and, I, and the auto you know, sector, by American, and the auto sector is going to hurt as well, all right? Of that. Yep. And, yeah, and our pipelines. So, yeah. if, if the United States will continue as a democracy. And the question I have is, are, politi are our political leaders thinking about this? Or are they thinking about maybe we should be increasing our military? What steps should we be taking taking economically to safeguard our, our, ourselves? I don't say I have the answers, but it, it, it disturbs me that none of our political leaders is creating a vision and even considering these trends right now. And we can't all be, you know, focused on the immediate and the pandemic, of course, and LRT and Ottawa and what have you. But these are important issues that will shape our futures, and it concerns me that nobody is talking about this, so I thought I'd start. Yeah, good stuff, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Yeah, bye-bye. Uh, Barry, Ottawa, Barry, you're on City News, Barry. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, good morning, Barry. Nice day if it doesn't rain. Yeah, well, you don't have to shovel rain, Barry, so that's what matters right now. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I uh, wanted to make a point about the LRT. Okay. It might be a bit facetious, but uh, I think uh, City Council should get a toy train set and see how long it takes them to put it together and run it without <laughs> derailing it. And then they should invite RTG into city council and get it all on video and see how long it takes them to put it together and run it without derailing it. Right, right, right. Yeah, like one of those old CN rail train kits that every kid dreamed about getting for Christmas, something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They could run it around the room and they could, instead of using email or FaceTime, they could just uh, send messages to each other around the room and the rail. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to mention after driving mostly dump truck for the last 20 years before retiring, uh, that driver, that uh, the commentator before there, the person that called in, he seemed to have a fair amount of knowledge and experienced driver. Yeah. Uh, I didn't uh, understand what he meant about mirrors, though. You know, you should always have your mirrors tucked in. I don't know where some guys would have their mirrors that they can't see the box when they're driving because that shows you your blind spot as well as okay. your spot mirror. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, uh, did did, did that ever walk. happen to you? And you, know, you spent 20 years driving a dump truck. I mean, did, were you ever going down the road and the thing was actually accidentally up? Or? Well, I never had it come up. No? Because lots of times if the PTO is engaged still, there's a light on your control panel in between the seats that shows the PTO is still on. Uh, there's... Uh, um, you know, there's a, like a grinding or a whining sound from the PTO. Uh, if you start driving in it, it's harder to shift the transmission if the PTO is in, uh, engaged. And uh, I just don't see how anybody can drive down the road with the box up in the air like that for any <laughs> length of time. Because when you put the box up in the air, Rob, it takes the weight off the front end. 
and you start driving down the road with the box. Well, you think you start doing yeah. a wheelie or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it will. It will. It'll bounce the front end up in the air. And I've actually done wheelies in dump trucks when you put the spreading chains on the tailgate, and the tailgate only opens maybe four to six inches, and you start spreading gravel. If you put the box up too high or go too fast with the box up, you have to slowly raise the box when you're spreading gravel with it Interesting. To, to get the whole load out. And if you do it too fast, then you can literally lift the, the front end right up off the ground. Unbelievable. Really. Yeah. But, uh, so there, imagine you're driving on the Queensway. Smash. Yeah, well, smash. There, was a driver, there was a driver on Riverside Drive there quite a few years ago, Rob, and he was actually the owner of the company. And uh, he... Uh, oh, Barry, I think we lost you, Barry. Sorry about that, Barry. Uh, let's go to Mark. Let's take Mark's call here. Uh, Mark. Good morning, Mark. Thank you, Rob. Yes, Mark. Concerning these protesters at Remembrance Day, yeah. in fact, they're not really protesters. Has anyone ever studied them to try to figure out what kind of people they actually are? And if they actually have any understanding of the cause they claim to be championing, I've long suspected that there's a certain element in society. They say they're champ championing freedom. 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 Well, I've long suspected that there's a certain element in society that thrive on mayhem. Mm. and they a uh, social path, and they like to disrupt, and they get some kind of exhilaration at getting attention for doing so. And the cause is the pretext, the opportunity, not the motivation. Mm. And they appear for anti-vax protests, for anarchists, for anti-globalization. You, you smash a window at McDonald's. Right. I, That's how they get their kicks. Exactly. And, okay. But has anyone actually studied this kind of thing? Yeah. Because desecrating Remembrance Day, no one would do that who seriously wanted to advance a cause. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. I'm going to take one more call because Terry's in the valley and he's been waiting, but we'll have to make it quick, like a minute or less, Terry. I'm sorry about that, but that's all we get. That's all they give us, Terry, is an hour. Hey, it's all good, Rob. Yeah. I just got two things i got to say quickly. Just a shout out to my uh, Old English Sheepdog Donut. Uh, just because okay. we're talking pets. And then uh, lastly, just the PCR testing. I've been to the States twice now, to, uh, once to Texas, once to Virginia, and 300 bucks at the Montreal airport, and we're gone for less than 72 hours. So I'm taking the test in Canada and using those same results to get back into Canada. Just don't understand it, and I'm hoping to change it soon. All right, Terry, thank you. Thank you for all of your calls this week and for being engaged in the issue. We'll do it again next week. We always do the talk back hour between 10 and 11 o'clock. Coming up next, Kathy Curry is the new city councillor for Canada North. You'll hear from her on City News.
IWW 1310 AM in Ottawa. And CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News. Now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, November 12th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now, rain in the region. It's 9 degrees in Ottawa, 11 in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. LRT running with seven trains today after that 54-day break following a derailment on September 19th. A couple of councillors took the train to work this morning. Tim Tierney from the east, Jeff Leeper from the west. Councillor Tierney says the trip was without incident and he is pleased to see both RTG and RTM making positive moves with staff. People are being shown the door. They're bringing in new expertise. They realize how important it is for their business uh, to maintain this contract. Uh, and uh, now we're finally starting to see changes. Is it too little too late? We'll have to wait and see. I don't want to see this kind of craziness ever again. Now, Tierney says people were pretty happy hopping on the train this morning as it shaves about 15 minutes off each trip on their daily commute. The newest member of Ottawa City Council being sworn in this morning at City Hall, Kathy Curry chosen by councillors from a list of 20 names that were submitted to take over the riding of Canada North for the duration of this term. That's till next October. Kathy Curry tells City News uh, there are priorities that she has. Immediately there are two planning applications though, that, are, that people are not happy about, so they've contacted me right away. So one is on uh, 100 Weeping Willow Lane is a concern, and the other is the growth in the, in the tech park. Now, Curry also says she wants to get to the bottom of what happened to LRT in the city, just like everyone else, and says everyone on council does have the same goal, just the approaches are different. More with the councillor coming up very shortly on the Rob Snow Show. City News Time 1103, now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. The wet weather will move out. We'll have some clearing today, brisk wind, the high near 12 degrees. It'll be mainly clear this evening. A few showers return, though, overnight, 3 degrees for the low. And for the weekend, cooler air, some showers and possibly some flurries as well, especially for Sunday, highs near 7. For today, the high 12. And right now in Ottawa, with rain, it's 9 degrees, 11 degrees in Smith Falls. A group of scientists advising the provincial government on COVID-19 is releasing its latest pandemic projections now. The COVID-19 science table publishing the modelling numbers for the coming weeks. It comes amid a resurgence of COVID-19 cases. Now today, Ontario reporting 598 new cases and four more deaths. Now, Health Minister Christine Elliott says 376 of the infected people today are not fully vaccinated, 222 cases in fully vaccinated people. Of 130 that are currently in intensive care recovering from COVID-19, 121 of them are not vaccinated. There was a deadly crash in the township of Madawaska Valley. It was yesterday around 1 in the afternoon. A car crashed into a tree on Coolers Road. The driver and lone occupant of that vehicle pronounced dead at the scene. The person's name has not been released. Minute-by-minute minute logs written by Houston first responders document the speed at which the Astroworld Music Festival spiraled into chaos one week ago. Here's ABC's Marcus Moore. New video shows a group of fans rushing the barricades at the festival's entrance. Similar scenes playing out as early as 9.20 a.m., according to handwritten logs obtained by Ted Oberg with our Houston station, KTRK. By 9.48, the first patient had been transported to a hospital. And just two minutes after the gates officially opened, a Houston firefighter noting the fences were breached and there was, quote, no control of participants. Scott's attorney has said he was unaware of any deaths due to the crowd surge until after the show. A ninth person did die of their injuries on Wednesday of this week. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Strong voice. Strong opinions. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. There's a new city councillor for the ward of Canada North. It is Kathy Curry, and Kathy Curry joins me this morning on City News. Good morning. Good morning. So how does it feel? Well, it's been a whirlwind so far, so uh, I'm, I'm excited. It's just that I realize there's a lot 
to deal with right off the bat. Yeah. So take us through what happens now. You're being sworn in today, and and, and then what? Then what happens? And then it's orientation, really. I mean, I think it's. Uh, I'll be probably speaking to as many different departments as I can, and uh, getting up to speed. I, I'm pretty sure planning right away will want to talk to me because there's so many files in Canada that need to be looked at right away. So I'm imagining that. But general orient orientation for sure. And you know, somebody's going to show me where the bathrooms are and things like that too. I'm sure. Okay. Why did you want the job? Well, I think that I have a lot to offer, for one, and I think that Canada, uh, number two, and if maybe that should be number one, needs good representation. And uh, I think, as I've said before, Councillor Hubley and Councillor Kavanaugh have been doing a great job, but it's tough trying to run your own ward and deal with someone else's. So, you know, Canada needed someone pretty quickly, and I think I can get up to speed quickly. And I think I bring in a lot of experience and also uh, experience as a person that goes out and talks to people, listens, and brings their views forward. Okay. So what's your background for people who aren't familiar with Kathy Curry? Who is Kathy Curry? So I started my life as a high school English teacher, and uh, that was loads of fun. And uh, I taught in a number of schools here in Ottawa, uh, high schools, AY Jackson and W um, West Carleton, sorry, I can't use the acronyms, and uh, Sir Guy Carleton and Sir Robert Borden. So I started doing that, and then when I started to have children, uh, Canada was growing so rapidly, and there were so many schools that needed to be built and added on to and everything else, I became involved with the school councils and worked with the trustee then. Our trustee retired hired and then I ran for trustee and I was trustee and chair of the board and then after that I spent a ton of time working and volunteering not working but volunteering on, on many of our local boards so I sit on the CHEO board I uh, chaired the Ontario Centre of Excellence for Children and Youth Mental Health Strategic Advisory Committee, uh, the Ronald McDonald House Ottawa Board, the Coswell Family Centre Board, the Ottawa Fusion Volleyball Board, and thinking, I'm sure there's another <laughs> one. Oh, yes, my most favourite almost board. You can't say that over CHEO, but the Ottawa Community Foundation Grants Committee, which is where I think I bring um, a lot of knowledge to City Hall because we look at all the not-for-profits and charitable organisation grant applications and believe it or not, Rob, there's 22,000 in our area that apply. Oh and uh, we get to look at what's going on all over the city. So when I say I'm going to be representing Canada, absolutely, but I understand that your role as a city councillor is to represent all of Ottawa at the same time. And I think I have a lot more Ottawa experience actually right now than Canada, even though I've lived there all, most of my life. Wow. Wow, that's very impressive. So all of that, and um, so obviously work-life balance is not an issue for you at all. <laughs> well, uh, honestly, people say that to me all the time. How do you possibly do all How do you do I, that? Yeah, I yeah. have lots of energy for sure, yeah. and I think I'm pretty efficient and effective. You know, I don't waste a lot of time. I don't... Uh, I, I look at every minute of the day as this is a precious minute here. What could I be doing with it? Right, right. But I also like, you know, I golf. I play the French horn in the concert band of Canada. I read a ton. You know, I, I make the most of my day, that's for sure. Okay, so just the me the mechanics of, of you being a new councillor, replacing a former councillor who's now gone on to another uh, position. How does it work with staffing in the councillor's office? Do you bring in your own people? Do you use the former councillor's staff? Just to, to get Give us a sense uh, of what's going to happen there. Uh. So I understand that uh, that's one of the things that I'll be talking about today, too, so I should have said that in, my, in your okay. earlier question. Okay. But I believe that Jenna took most of the staff with her. You know, they know her. They know how she works. They have their system set up. So I get that. Right. So I'll have to hire new staff. Now, I know someone already who has been involved in that area. She's semi-retired, and I think, but she's so good at what she does. She's helped a lot of different leaders in our in our area at every level. So I'm I'm hoping and I contact her and talk to her longer, but otherwise, I don't have anyone else that I'm thinking about. She only came to mind. She reached out and said, congratulations. And I thought, oh, there's an idea. But I don't know, Rob. And that's job one for me because it's such a big job. You need good staff. So I do have to get on that right away. So when you think about issues that um, as counselor uh, for your ward, that you're really going to have to kind of hit the ground running. What are some of those big issues? Uh, you know, I'm thinking the golf course and, and whatnot. Uh, yeah, for sure. So right. immediately there are two planning applications so that are that people are not happy about, so they've contacted me right away. So one is on uh, 100 Weeping Willow Lane is a concern, and the other is the growth in the in the tech park. So those two, because, it, you know, Rob, 
the same things, traffic, uh, what does it mean for um, jobs, what does it mean for our lives, what does it mean for visibility, where I live, I won't be able to see across the road anymore. Yeah, so there, yeah. those kinds of concerns. So absolutely those two, but the golf course is, is uh, you know, pending for sure. We'll get that decision. And I, as I've said before in other interviews, that decision is an enormous decision. It, it, whatever is, ru- is ruled, first of all, that won't be the end of it, and even if we win. And second of all, people um, generally believe it's more about the golf course when really the, the potential for the city to be ruled against and its ability to enter into long-term land agreements, that's really serious. And that would affect all the city, potentially if precedent is set there, municipalities all across Ontario and maybe even further. Yeah, to me, when, whenever I'm out in Canada, Stittsville, that area, I'm not, I'm not out there that often. But, And maybe it's the fact that I'm not out there that often that I, I really recognize. It's just trying to manage the growth uh, within the existing infrastructure and what a challenge that is. I mean, if you're going, uh, you know, westbound and you're uh, in the morning and you're approaching March Road, you have your own rush hour. I know. Uh, I mean, people think of rush hour getting into the downtown core and through the split and these kinds of things. Um, th- you know, there's a westbound rush hour now uh, I know. to get into the tech park. It's really something. Yeah. When you try to get down March Road, you know, you, you really have to bank on that. You know, you think, OK, well, it takes me 20 minutes to get out to Canada, except I'm going to sit on March Road for 15 minutes as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 really quite something. Uh, so there are obviously there are some hot issues um, right now. Um, do do you feel y- y- you're up to date on on things like you know light rail and RTM and back to service and you know calls for inquiries and this kind of stuff? Um, well, I certainly watched the uh, meeting there the other day just yeah. before our our. Um, process right and uh so i but i also i've also been reading i mean and there isn't a single person in this city that doesn't want to understand better what happened and what has gone wrong and i've said to a number of people that's the detail of it the the long-term vision though i mean for light rail to come out to canada like how wonderful would that be we, really to the point we just were talking about mm-hmm. like to, we could cut down some of that traffic the light rail system is visionary and it's an amazing thing it's had some problems back to the micro and and really everyone wants to get to the bottom of that that the decision the other day auditor general versus judicial inquiry you know everyone at that table though rob if you think about it a hundred percent of counselors want to get to the bottom of it they differ on how they think that process should go but um i understand the need to do that you have to figure out what went wrong because we have so much ahead of us and we don't want to make the same mistakes again yeah the mayor um cast his vote for you uh, do you know him do you get along with him how would you describe your relationship if you even have one with jim watson well jim and i uh definitely had a number of conversations over the caldwell family center you know it's expanding into a new location and we needed to uh understand better if we could have a section of land it, it didn't turn out that way but in those conversations i certainly talked to jim but when i was a, a school trustee and jim was in a different role we were at different meetings together and we always you know socially you know we met each other said hello um generally though i think jim is everywhere and so it's hard to know anybody that doesn't really know jim a little bit right so i've i've watched him i've seen him at every event under the sun you know that's who he's always been so i don't like know him personally but uh i I certainly have appreciated all that he's done over his terms and i also appreciate his help with caldwell for sure okay well again congratulations um oh i must ask you are you are you going to run again are you going to run in the next election you know what? Right this moment, I have no plans because I'm no working plans. on my Masters of Counseling Psychology gradually. Um, so w- that's my, my more long-range plan. So right this second, I don't. Um, we will see how it goes. You know, it really depends. Oh, it depends. Okay. Well, enjoy the ride. Thank you okay. so much. Thank, Thank you, you very much for this Kathy interview, Curry. too, Rob. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. I started, as I said, at Lester's Barber Shop, and it was kind of, um, it was one of those things that it was just an opportune time for me to get into it, just because he had decided that he was going to retire after the fire, and then the opportunity presented itself that I could open my own shop, and so um, 
I went from 150 square foot space on St. Patrick Street to a 600 square foot space um, just on Beachwood to now here and I'm in a 1400 square foot space now and um, I don't know it's been an interesting journey because you know you think that you're just going to be just you or a really small space and then all of a sudden you know you've got 10 other people working for you you're in a much bigger space and even incorporating the boutique well, last March when all of this started I mean we closed down a little bit earlier than everybody else and I'm gonna say you know being honest part of it was social pressure we, we shut down before everybody else did and I'm watching all these other salons you know just be really responsible and say we don't want to be a part of the process so we got ahead of it and and closed and then you know the week later the government's like everybody's shutting down and so it was a little nerve wracking. I guess the first step of us, you know, trying to innovate and um, just keep moving forward was when the salon is closed, right? It's like, what do you do? Our whole, our whole industry is based on um, being with people, cutting their hair, providing a service. You have to be people together to do that. You can't do that remotely at all. So, um, one of the first things that I saw in our industry, what people were trying to do is they were selling their hair products that they had. And luckily, I've had a website that always had a web store in the back. I just never used it. So as soon as I saw that people were doing that, I was like, okay, if this is what we're going to do. I'm going to load up all my stuff. And so that worked out really, really well. And then from there, I, I managed to find a place that was like a wholesale website that allowed you to have net 60 days. So you don't have to, you can order all the stuff. You don't have to prepay any of it. Um, you, there's free returns, all that. So that made it really easy for me to bring in other products and start trying to sell it. And uh, so I went from selling hair products to shave products to bath and body products to um, a little bit of clothing and jewelry. And now it's just morphed into this whole, like I wanna make it a whole legit boutique. And uh, by December of last year, I decided that it, like this is a full fledged thing and we're gonna separate it, it's its own company. So it's just, it's really finding an opportunity that's there and running with it. So it's been really fun. Our clients are loving it. Our clients that have been here for a long time, they love it. The world is changing. So keep up with Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. In sports, it's great to welcome back from the Sens Nation podcast. SensationHockey.com. Steve Warren. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Rob. Well, it's uh, these are tough times to be a to be a Sens fan, to be an Ottawa sports fan. Uh, quite frankly, uh, mercifully, it's almost the last game for the Ottawa Red Blacks, and that season will uh, come to an end before we can do an old yeller to it. And uh, boy, slowly but surely, the Sens season has slip, slip, sliding away. You were at the game last night, uh, Steve. They put in a good effort, but my gosh, they're 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 shorthanded, Steve, because of COVID. What did you think of last night? Well, I think based on the circumstances, it was an elite performance with so many new bodies and uh, and line shuffling and so many guys out of the lineup. I think you have to look at that game. I mean, it's hard when you're a Sens fan and you see the number of losses, you see where they are in the standings, the record. It's hard to take any silver lining. People are getting sick of silver lining playbooks here. But I think that if you assess that game onto itself and the circumstances leading into it, I thought it was an elite performance. I thought they looked as good defensively as they have for at any point this season, maybe. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, you, you have to be pretty happy with that performance. And, and it was only a couple of bounces uh, d- the difference in the game, the Sens have a couple off the crossbar. L.A. gets a couple of funky deflections. The only thing that was able to beat Gustafson on the night. So uh, a little bit of puck luck, and that's a different outcome. So I, I, I would have been pleased with the effort if I'm D.J. Smith. Yeah, I'm playing the hottest team in the league, right? 100%. Six, yep. six straight wins, seven now. Yep. So absolutely. Yeah, okay, okay. There's some question about whether the Senators should be playing at all. Um, what do you think about that, Steve? I certainly thought that uh, going to be, I mean, I was keeping an eye on things, obviously, because I was going to the game myself and wondering whether they'd call it a day. I mean, when you're starting to approach 
half your roster yeah. uh, sidelined with COVID. It's not just a matter of can the team ice a competitive team. That's a secondary issue. It's more about a team like the LA Kings who come in, you know, they're fiery hot like you talked about. They come in and now they're going to slam up against a team for three hours that may actually, a number of them may in fact be skating around unknowingly having COVID, like carrying the virus but not positive diagnosis yet. So, yeah, I think there would have been lots of discussion as to whether that game should proceed, but it did, and uh, we'll see if there's any ramifications from it down the line. All right. On social media, following the uh, Sens Twitter, lots of praise for uh, a new Sen, Lassie Thompson. Tell us about him. He was one of their first-rounders uh, in, uh, in recent drafts. And before I get into praise... I want to preface it by saying it's only one game. His NHL debut might have been, you know, all adrenaline and excitement and energy. The NHL is a grind, so I think we need to wait and see what this looks like over the longer haul. But uh, now that I've said that, he was really good last night. I thought he was one of the best defensemen on the ice. Maybe the Sens' best defenseman, just so smooth, great decisions with the puck. Uh, I thought a high upgrade on some of the defensive performances we've seen out of some of the veterans. So absolutely loved his game, uh, but again, only one game. I hope they keep him with the club. I thought he and Brandstrom both played well, and both are, I think, sizable upgrades on some of the guys they've been trucking out there this year. Okay. As well, one of the the call-ups has been Igor Sokoloff. Now, uh, you know, just a little bit of history on him. Played for uh, the Cape Breton Screaming Eagles of the Quebec League, which is the same team that uh, Drake Batherson played for for a while, uh, most of his uh, career in the queue. I believe they had the same um, billet family as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, really um, a, a great player in the Quebec League. Played well for uh, Team Russia at the World Juniors. Everybody, he has this supersized personality, huge commitment, uh, community commitment kind of guy. Um, what have you thought of his uh, play, of, uh, of, of what you've seen, Steve? I like so much of it. I mean, you, you talk about a great kid, like de- definitely yet another high-character guy in the room. You can see that he's committed because he has passed over in a couple of NHL drafts, not one but two. He's got, uh, he's got a big shot, really tough to move, but and this is the big but, he's got to find some quickness. Mm-hmm. He reminds me a little bit of Colin Greening. Skating is a lot like his. Uh, for those of your listeners who remember Colin Green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yep, but yep. Uh, I mean, so much of the game is about quick acceleration, the stopping hard, going back the other way as fast as you can, and racing an opponent to those loose pucks that are 10 feet away. And that's what's missing in Sokolov's game. And unfortunately, I think it's missing by a big margin. So he's going to have to find that, I think, to be a regular NHLer. Okay. Speed. Needs some speed. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's, all, that's the NHL game, right, Steve? Got to be... Got to have quickness. Got to have, uh, got to have some speed. So next game uh, is tomorrow. Uh, Penguins are in town, so it doesn't get any easier. They're always tough. The Penguins are always going to be tough. So, no Crosby or Malkin, though. Probably okay. yeah, Crosby's dealing with COVID, and okay. Malkin's okay. been out with a knee most of the season, if not all. So they're they're shorthanded too, like the Sens. Okay, who's the goaltender for the Penguins now? Because uh, Matt Murray's here and um, Flurry is in Chicago now, right? So, uh... Yeah, it's been a bit of a revolving door, but they, they've settled on, uh, and that's why hmm. Matt Murray is an Ottawa senator, because, uh, well, they gauged him the way a lot of Sens fans do. They, they saw some holes in his game, and they felt like Tristan Jerry, who is their new guy now, they, uh, okay. they okay. felt like he would be a better answer moving forward as, as Matt Murray became uh, UFA, they decided, okay, we'll deal him near the end of the season and get what we can for him and then and move on. And It's kind of uh, interesting. Uh, Marc-Andre Fleury still rolling along in the NHL uh, years after the Penguins let him go, and they, they let him go because they thought Matt Murray was the guy. So it's funny how things go when you're evaluating players in the league. All right, it is. Week 10 in the National Football League. those Broncos how about those Broncos um, <laughs> no look Steve so I've already you know I'm, I'm, I'm settling in uh, it's Sunday 
it has not been a good sports weekend. Uh, you know, Red Blacks lose, Senators lose, and now I have to sit down. I'm going to watch the Broncos play the Cowboys. The Cowboys are 6-1. and one. The Broncos have not looked good. They're a 500 team, but they don't really even deserve to be a 500 team. And it's, you know, all the lines say it's da- going to be Dallas by 10 points, Dallas by 10 points. The Broncos go in there. Oh, and by the way, they've just traded away their Hall of Fame, Super Bowl, MVP, uh, defensive player, best defensive player they've ever had probably in Vaughn Miller. So I'm not, I'm like, oh, okay, I'll sit down and watch Dallas smoke the Denver Broncos. Somehow the Broncos come out and they crush the Dallas Cowboys. And um, anytime that happens is a great day. It salvaged my whole sports weekend. So um, go Broncos. <laughs> uh, the season is back on track. Uh, not so for your your uh, Packers last week. Uh, without Aaron Rodgers, they lost, right, to the Chiefs? And they didn't look very good with Jordan Love yeah. on your center, to be honest. <laughs> like you would think, and I think, yeah, the final score was 13-7, I think, which is not much of a Packers-Chiefs game. Right. Like, no, I mean at the start of the year you would have that circled as a game to watch. Oh, the game to watch. Yeah. 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 But no Aaron Rodgers and, and Pat Mahomes seems to I don't know. I don't know what's going on with Mahomes. He just does not look like the quarterback no. uh that we've seen in the past. Um and then Green Bay, if you're a Packer fan, I mean you couldn't have any problem with that defensive performance. It's just the offense couldn't score in the absence of Aaron Rodgers. I think Jordan Love, given half a season. I think he might actually be a really good quarterback, but in your NFL debut um, on a team that's been rolling the way the, that the Packers have, it's uh, it's a lot to ask to have him go in there and be elite right away or even be a, a shadow of Aaron Rodgers. So uh, I guess that's a lack of offense was to be expected there. So what's the deal? Is Rodgers going to play this weekend against the Seahawks or what? I'd be shocked if he, he does. He's on the, he goes on a, a podcast, the Pat McAfee show, on a weekly basis, and uh, he said this week that he there's a chance he won't play, but it's only a small chance. So you got his quarantine ending tomorrow. Uh, he'll have to provide a negative test there and be symptom free. He's saying he feels great, and um, but it's hard to say. And I mean, I don't know if he's got. I mean, he's he's the franchise, so I would imagine doctors have been doing tests mm-hmm. in his apartment and all that stuff. So I I'd be shocked if uh, if he isn't under center. On uh, on Sunday, um, so and it'll be interesting because Russell Wilson is back for the Seahawks too. So uh, both offenses in that game getting a bit of a, a boost with their return of their starters. Yeah, e- you know, even uh, even the, if it is Seahawks and Packers, there's just some added drama this this weekend. So that 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 is going to be, I think, the game of the weekend to watch on uh, Sunday, the afternoon, what the afternoon prime game on yep, Sunday, late, late afternoon. Yep. All right, Steve. Thanks. thanks Talk to you all. next week. Bye bye. Uh, Bye. Yep. From the uh, Sens Nation podcast, SensationHockey.com, Steve Warren, Queens Park Week in Review. Coming up right after the news on City News.
one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. This is Friday, the 12th of November. Good morning, I'm Jason White. Right now in Ottawa, cloudy sky, 10 degrees. It's 10 in Smith Falls. Here's what's making news this hour. Ontario Science Advisory Table is out with its latest pandemic forecast, saying most public health units continue to see COVID-19 case numbers increase. While hospitalizations and ICU occupancy rates are stable now, the table forecasts overall occupancy of intensive care units is likely to increase, hitting 200 patients early in the new year. The science table says that a deliberate policy on Ontario's reopening is the right decision at this time. The OPP have now identified the two people who were killed in this week's fatal collision on Highway 17 between Pembroke and Petawawa. The driver was 63-year-old Timothy Hudson. The passenger, 64-year-old Susan Hudson, both of them from Chatham in southwestern Ontario. The O-Train is back on the rails, literally. This is the first day of service since the trains were taken out of commission for 53 days following the Confederation Line's second derailment. So far, no issues reported today. The newest member of Ottawa City Council is being sworn in at City Hall. Kathy Curry was chosen by councillors to represent Canada North for the rest of this term from a list of 20 candidates. City News Time 1132. I'm Jason White. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Firm. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Okay, let's launch into it here. It's time for Queen's Park Week in Review. The gang's all here. John Vantoff is here for uh, Gilles Bissau from the New Democrats. Uh, John Vantoff is the New Democrat MPP for Timiskaming Cochran, and he's in Cobalt, Ontario today. John Vantoff, good morning. Hey. All the batteries are shining bright and cold. I bet they are. I bet they are. But what are you paying for gas? <laughs> 152. 152. About a dime a liter. About a dime we a need, liter more we than. Need all uh, the batteries we can get. I guess you do. <laughs> I guess you do. John Fraser, Liberal Ottawa South. John Fraser. John. How you doing, Rob? I'm good, John. How you? How How was your week, John? Good week. Great. Good week. Good. Okay. And Goldie Gamari's in Ottawa. How are you, Goldie? Uh, progressive Conservative MPP. Her writing is Carlton. And I want to start with, uh, it's great to hear from you, uh, Goalie. As you know, uh, uh, I want to start with you, Goalie, a public uh, inquiry for Ottawa's troubled LRT. Let's let's start on this one. Um, it, as you just heard in our newscast, 53 days, the people of Ottawa did not have access to their light rail system. And it has a cascading effect through the entire transit system. Light rail goes down. It's more stress on the bus system, but other bus routes are canceled. Buses are pulled off. Other routes put onto our one bus service. So today, the light rail trains are finally running again, but the city ordered 17. Only seven are operating. And the fact is, even before this 53-day shutdown, the Confederation line, as you know, Goldie's just been plagued with problems. Okay? So this week, yeah. the council voted, the city council voted against a motion to call for a judicial inquiry, but your government seems to be indicating that it's not out of the question that there could be a, 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 a public inquiry called by the province. Um, what would be the motivation there? What's going on, Goldie Gamari? Give us, a, give us well, some insight into the government's thinking here. Well, the motivation, Rob, is that you have a city that has completely mismanaged phase one of LRT. Um, it's being talked about all over North America. The city has wasted millions and millions of taxpayer dollars trying to get this system up and running. It hasn't been working. Um, even today, uh, I don't know why the city is, is you know, bragging about the fact that it's a partial reopen when it should be a full reopen. And, you know, at the end of the day, the city has now voted down a motion to initiate a judicial inquiry two times. And the public has lost faith in the city. Um, transportation stakeholders have lost faith in the city. And quite frankly, the, the provincial government, Premier Ford and Minister Mulroney, and you know myself and other Ottawa area MPPs, we've lost faith in the city because this is a, a big deal. And you know it's, it's time that we step in and try to fix this mess that Jim Watson created. Okay, okay, all right. Uh- We'll get to John Vantoff in a moment. Kind of a local issue here, John Vantoff. You'll bear with us, I'm sure. No uh, but John Fraser, uh, your yeah. response, please, John Fraser. Yeah, it's just it's interesting to listen, listen to Goldie attack City Council uh, and the mayor. 
I mean, look, the most important thing here, I think everybody agrees on, is that light rail needs to get up and running safely without interruption. That's what needs to happen. And if that doesn't happen, the next step, if we're going to do anything judicial, is to go to court. And what the province and the federal government should be saying to the city of Ottawa is, look, you've got some contractors. They haven't lived up to their obligation. You have a contract. Let's take them to court. And we'll back you. Because we're partners in this. And, you know, the, the auditor in the city can do an audit. The provincial auditor can do an audit. We can do a judicial inquiry when we want to look in the rearview mirror. But right now, we have a system that hasn't worked as it was sold to us. And there are companies that are doing work all across Ontario, and Goldie would know this, in Toronto, across Ontario, the same companies. And we have to send a message to those companies. It's not about picking fights between different levels of government. It's about holding people to the contracts that they signed. And so when I see this stuff, it's like you got the cart before the horse. Okay, is that what you would say, uh, John, John, John? Yeah. Is that what you would say to city councillors like uh, Catherine McKenney, Sean Menard, Jeff Leeper, uh, Councillor Diane Deans, uh, if, who, you know, that's your part of town, John, Councillor Deans. Yeah. Um, all of these people are calling for a public uh, inquiry into well, this in uh, Ottawa, John. I have uh, to ask myself right now. Right. The most important thing is to get this thing up and running. Um, as well, you, you can know, do both, safely, John, safe, right? Safe, well, well, no, actually, because they're getting up and running safely. And if, it, and if there are still problems, we have to take the consortia, we have to take legal action there. And what they should be asking for is they should be asking for the province and the federal government as a first order of business. Let's, if we're going to go before a judge, let's go before them about a contract. And then if, some, if, you know, if people want to do a judicial inquiry after that, that's, that's okay. I'm not going to criticize that. I just think the order of operations is just, it's just not consistent with trying to actually achieve the goal that we're all trying to achieve. It's like, you know, we're, you want to look in the rear view mirror? No, actually right now it's about looking out the front window and saying to the companies, you need to make good. Well, I, and then if we, and but if, what, and but, once but, we get there, then go ahead and take a look at it. I, 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 I don't, okay. I don't object to that. I just think it's, uh, we've got it. You know, I mean, John Van Toff, for off. example, John Van Toff, I, I got you, John, we'll, we'll yeah. come back to you. Okay. But John Van Toff, for example, you, you, your constituents in Temiskaming, uh, uh, ha, have put money into light rail in Ottawa. Uh, $600 million for phase one and more than a billion dollars for phase two, which is under construction right now. That's, you know, $1.8 billion. Exactly. Makes the and province of Ontario a major stakeholder in this project. Yep. Um, yes. And it's not gone well. It's, uh, you know, 53 days is extraordinary, extraordinary. If you can imagine the TTC being down for 53 days. Yeah. Uh, it has been um, dysfunctional for two years. It has let riders down for two years. Um, what's wrong with what, what, what is there? Do you, what's your opinion on the province having yep. a public inquiry into finding out what who, who knew what when they knew it? Why decisions were made, John? Do you have any problem yep. with that as a new Democrat? First of all, we do not begrudge um, the province putting money into Ottawa LRT. Um, one of our MPPs, Joel Harden, was one of the first to call for an auditor, for the Auditor General to look into it, and we are not opposed to a judicial inquiry. Uh, we support it. Because if the system was working, and if contracts were being followed, and if the system was working as it was supposed to, we those people of Ottawa wouldn't be in position they're in. Because we're hearing from people, even though the light rail is back on, they're nervous to get actually use it so the system you can't really look you need to look in the rear view mirror when the car hasn't worked for a long time so just say okay let's move forward and let's turn our heads and hopefully fix it there's something went seriously wrong here and we need to know what it is so that it doesn't happen again and not just in ottawa but in other areas so it's not often that we uh and i don't know if it's the council i'm i'm far away from ottawa but there's obviously something that isn't working. It's a huge investment, and and it's light rail. It's not the space shuttle, right? So what what <laughs> is going what is going on here? 
right? So we okay. need to know so it doesn't continue to happen and doesn't happen again. And one thing that a judicial inquiry would do, it would allow the people who are being impacted most to actually make depositions in front of that inquiry. I mean, it seems to me, Goldie Gamari, that a turning point for the powers that be in your government was when Bob Shirelli, the former mayor of Ottawa, former MPP, cabinet minister, uh, in John's government, leaked the contents of an email to the CBC this week, um, an email sent to him by Brian Guest of Boxfish. Now, that firm has done work on transit projects, not just here in Ottawa, but in Toronto and in Hamilton and, and in Peel. And in that email... Uh, because Mr. Shirelli was on my program and said, well, the city council should have a vote on a ju judicial inquiry. In other words, he wasn't opposed to it, at least the council having the vote. Because remember, the first time around, Mayor Watson wouldn't even allow a vote on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. There were procedural maneuverings to even present this from coming to a vote. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Guest in that email said, and I quote, you know who you are screwing with this support for the judicial inquiry? You know who you are screwing with? In other words, screwing with, screwing with. I'm going to get screwed if there's a judicial inquiry. Uh, that seems to be a turning point for the Ford government. Am I reading this wrong, Goldie? Or Well, that's definitely one of the factors that uh, is, is influencing this decision. And, and let's just, let me just be just very clear about one thing. Um, all options are on the table right now at the provincial level. So right. um, Minister Mulroney is currently um, reviewing all the options available. So whether that's going to be a judicial inquiry or a re review by the Ontario uh, you know, Auditor General on further measures, um, again, like a decision hasn't been made yet as right. to what step the province will take, but I can say with 100% confidence that we will be taking some action uh, as soon as Minister Mulroney and, and Premier Ford review all of the options. But the, the other thing I just wanted to, to point out as well is, um, is you know, John Frazier is saying that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here or the province is here trying to pick fights with municipal council. That's not it at all. What's really mm -hmm. happening here is this is about protect, protecting our taxpayer dollars and our transit riders. There's a lot of money on mm -hmm. the line. We need to make sure that the money is being used and spent appropriately. And, you know, if, if, if John wants me to focus on provincial politicians, then maybe he should ask Stephen Blay, who used to be chair of the Ottawa mm -hmm. Transit Committee, why he messed up this project back when he was a city councillor. And it's interesting because with this letter that now came out, it yes. looks like there's a lot of dirty laundry in the Liberal Party from past Liberal yeah. uh, m members, politicians, um, and, and it's just mm. come to life. And okay. It's, it's okay. Well, by the way, the call for the... Uh, uh, by the way, now, just... Now, uh, I uh, uh, now I understand I why John okay. Fraser oh, and the Liberal Party right. does not want the... Yes, yeah, respond, John. It. Respond, John Fraser. I, by I all guess means. we don't need a judicial inquiry because Goldie's already figured it out. I guess my question to you, Goldie, is why would the provincial government, and the federal government for that matter, not be saying to the city of Ottawa and the companies that they were contracted with, we're going to stand behind this project in court because you're doing a lot of business with them. I haven't heard the province say that. I haven't heard the federal government say that either, but I haven't heard, heard the province say that. All that you're talking about, right, is politics. We're in, we are actually in a contractual in agreement with companies that were working across on yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when it comes to SNC-Lavalin, the Trudeau government is more interested in making sure SNC-Lavalin oh. never goes to court. That's their track record on well, SNC-Lavalin. Well, I just, I just, I believe that the correct order of operations, I'm not saying don't do this. I'm just saying do things in the right order. So you don't think right. that we as a pro as a government should look into why this I, project is not working? I, all right. Num all right. Number one, understand here's, okay, how okay. so okay. many millions of taxpayers' here's, dollars have been wasted. Here's, you don't okay. think, here's you don't what think I said. we should be doing that? Maybe that's said, why we're in no, government not and you're not, John. All right. All right. All right. Hold, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. John Vantoff. John Vantoff. John Vantoff. Uh, your, <laughs> your, your caucus mate, John Vantoff, says this is a perfect project for the provincial auditor general. What do you think about that, John Vantoff? Uh, like I said, we, we, we were the first. Uh, Joel Harden was one of the first to call for uh, 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 someone, an independent party, to look into it. Uh, we would be. We are still on board with the auditor general or with the judicial inquiry. 
This this project yeah. has gone off the rails far enough that simply saying, well, let's just let the lawyers look into it. I, I There's been way too much money gone, way too much service for the people of Ottawa. And quite frankly, it's a safety issue now because I don't think mm. anyone has confidence that, that this system is going to run as it should from here on in. And, I agree. and that is I, a big I, issue. Yeah. So... Uh, I certainly so, won't be taking well, the LRP John, John Fraser, well. honest to God, John Fraser, how can you defend a system that hasn't served the people of Ottawa I'm for 53 days? I, I'm not defending a system. What I'm saying is there's a correct order of operations here. And one is get the thing up and running safely without an interruption. Number two, if you have to, make sure people are living up to their end of the bargain in the contract. I agree with the Auditor General looking into it. I don't have, I don't, uh, that's fine with me. I, I think that's the a good provincial thing. Auditor General? The, yeah. yeah. I'm okay. Good with All right. That. Yeah, okay. I support All Joel's right. motion in that regard. And then if we get we get through those operations and we want to do digital inquiry, then let's do one. But let's do the, the things that we need to do first. That, you know, it, it, it's just the cart's going before the horse. And there's no question we've got to get to the bottom. But we've got to do, we have to take the right steps. Okay, we're going to stop here. Be back with part two of Queen's Park Week in Review here on the Rob Snow Show on City News. I started, as I said, at Lester's Barber Shop, and it was kind of, um, it was one of those things that it was just an opportune time for me to get into it, just because he had decided that he was going to retire after the fire, and then the opportunity presented itself that I could open my own shop. And so um, I went from a 150 square foot space on St. Patrick Street to a 600 square foot space um, just on Beechwood to now here and I'm in a 1400 square foot space now and um, I don't know it's been an interesting journey because you know you think that you're just going to be just you or a really small space and then all of a sudden you know you've got 10 other people working for you you're in a much bigger space and even incorporating the boutique well, last March when all of this started, I mean, we closed down a little bit earlier than everybody else. And I'm going to say, you know, being honest, part of it was social pressure. We, we shut down before everybody else did. And I'm watching all these other salons, you know, just be really responsible and saying we don't want to be a part of the process. So we got ahead of it and, and closed. And then, you know, the week later, the government's like everybody's shutting down. And so it was a little nerve wracking. I guess the first step of us you know, trying to innovate and um, just keep moving forward was when the salon is closed, right? It's like, what do you do? Our whole, our whole industry is based on um, being with people, cutting their hair, providing a service. You have to be people together to do that. You can't do that remotely at all. So um, one of the first things that I saw in our industry, what people were trying to do is they were selling their hair products that they had. And luckily, I've had a website that always had a web store in the back. I just never used it. So as soon as I saw that people were doing that, I was like, okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to load up all my stuff. And so that worked out really, really well. And then from there, I, I managed to find a place that was like a wholesale website that allowed you to have net 60 days. So you don't have to, you can order all the stuff. You don't have to prepay any of it. Um, you, there's free returns, all that. So that made it really easy for me to bring in other products and start trying to sell it. And uh, so I went from selling hair products to shave products to bath and body products to um, a little bit of clothing and jewelry. And now it's just morphed into this whole, like I wanna make it a whole legit boutique. And uh, by December of last year, I decided that it's like, this is a full fledged thing and we're gonna separate it, it's its own company. So it's just, it's really finding an opportunity that's there and running with it. So it's been really fun. Our clients are loving it. Our clients that have been here for a long time, they love it. Community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. 10 minutes before noon, that means we have seven minutes. Seven minutes. We're with Goldie Gamari, PC MPP, riding as Carlton. John Fraser, Liberal MPP, riding as Ottawa South. And John Van Toff, NDP MPP, the riding is Temiskaming Cochrane. Okay, um, I want to talk about Highway 413 because uh, Doug Ford is really, really pushing this and vows it will be built. There is um, a lot of opposition to this, not only from the opposition parties, 
uh, but municipalities as well along the route of this proposed highway north western gta it's called uh, uh, otherwise known as gta west uh that your government is insisting the premier insists this project is going to go ahead goldie gamari what what's what are the benefits of this highway well i'll tell you one thing rob over the next 30 years the population of the greater golden horseshoe area is expected to reach 15 million people and that means in the next five years and every five years after that one million more people will be using our highways to get to work every day and to get home at the end of the evening. And the difference between our government, Rob, and the previous government is that while they waited um, until a problem was so big and then they had to react to it, we are taking a proactive approach to figuring out and resolving these issues uh, before they become suited of a problem. I mean, congestion is already huge in the area. Um, you know, I when I'm in Toronto and I'm uh, at Queen's Park, um, initially I was like, great, my family lives in Richmond Hill. After work, I can go drive uh, to visit them in the evenings. Well, the first few times I tried that, you know, I'm done Queen's Park at 6, 6.30. If I was going to leave at 6.30, I wouldn't get to Richmond Hill until approximately 8 o'clock. And then, you know, what I have maybe one hour of time to spend with my family and then I have to get back to, to downtown Toronto. So what this is really about is about uh, respecting people's time, helping shorten the, the driving time of the commute so that people can spend more time with their loved ones and not being stuck in traffic. And it's very confusing to me why um, the other parties are not supportive of this. John Fantoff. John Fantoff. Go ahead, John Fantoff. Why is your party opposed to Highway 13? We are opposed to Highway uh, 14, 413, um, and you should try using the 407. It's pretty empty lots of times. It's too bad the government leased it out for 99 years. But the, one of the biggest reasons to oppose Highway 14 in the next 30 years, all those people have to eat, too. And the Ford government is is what do you running mean they have to eat? What do you mean they have to eat? The best agricultural land in Ontario, and everyone yeah. knows who you build a highway through it, you are going to build build it and they will come and you're going to build houses you're going to build all kinds of stuff on the best agricultural land in the province and one thing what most people should have learned from the pandemic is it is possible to have empty shelves if you aren't self-sufficient in food and we yep. think it is so short-sighted mm. to, to take the best land in ontario the best land in north america and build highways through it okay john fraser well, uh, it's hard to understand why they're building a highway that's going to save people 30 seconds. And I think Well, they say it's going to uh, save 30 minutes. So. No, yeah. So there's a study out that clearly shows 30 seconds. Government doesn't show any studies. The premier's pulled that number out of somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, he won't tell us. But here's the thing. Just well, The easiest thing to do is just cross-reference the people who own land along that route with the government's PC donor list. I think there's a few investigative journalists oh, who've done that on. work. People can go take a look at that. But here, more importantly, is the Ford government just had forgave $1 billion to the people who own the 407 instead of reducing tolls. So we asked the Auditor General to take a look at that. We don't think that makes any sense. But the other thing is, why would we spend $8 billion on a highway that saves 30 seconds when we could invest that money in our kids, in our schools. That's where we believe that money should be. And I, I agree totally with John. Paving over farmland is not the right thing to do. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, the Ontario government's temporary pandemic sick day program is supposed to end in less than two months, but the government hasn't indicated whether or not it's going to either extend the program or create a permanent program. Um What's going to happen, Goldie? Come on, tell us. Tell us what's going to well, happen here. Rob, I mean, paid sick leave is one of the many tools in our toolkit to support workers. Just look at our track record, Rob. We've already extended the program twice. Okay. Uh, and I know that the minister so is make it permanent? at all options, including a possible extension, because expiration, the expiration date is coming up quick. So, you know, look at our track record. We've, continue, we've supported workers throughout the pandemic, and we will continue to support them moving forward. All right, John uh, Vantoff. Uh, goalie says, look at the track record. Let's look at the track record. The first, the first thing I'm sorry, Goldie, you kind of walked into that one. Uh, when they were elected was halt the minimum wage increase and cancel the paid sick days that were there. So let's look at the track record. So we have to, people of Ontario have to be very 
leery of what actually the Ford government, what their actual track record is going to be. They were forced to do paid sick days because we, everyone pushed so hard, not just not just the politicians, mm. everyone pushed and pushed and forced the government to actually do the right thing. It's going to be okay, very interesting to see if they're actually the going to continue to do the right we thing. We are the first to okay. introduce unlimited uh. job-protected leave to help support workers during the pandemic. John, you, don't get paid. John you sound so <laughs> exasperated today. I don't know what uh, You don't get paid, do Goldie. You. It's nice to protect somebody's job so good, but paid sick days are about getting paid. And yeah. I remember when you took the paid two sick days away along with the minimum wage, and you and all your caucus mates cheering on the premiers. He said it was the greatest thing since he, when he took that all away. And then it took, John, it's right, 400 days of literally everybody in the province calling on your government to get paid 10 paid sick days, and you gave three. And you made them, you didn't make them permanent, you made them temporary. You got a piece of labor legislation right now that's in front. Yeah, and you, you, you haven't you put guys, it in there. You guys are good so at playing politics here because instead of actually answering the question or giving your opinion, you just the fall in the back. Oh, oh, right. Right. Well, things have happened before. Uh, you, there you go. You guys, you guys, you guys sometimes you make this panel like light rail. It just goes completely off the rails. You get go, I'm calling my own public inquiry into this panel. Here. All right. That's it. That's it. All right. All right. It's over. It's over. Have a good weekend. Goodbye, everybody. I'll be back on Monday. This is the Rob Snow Show show on city news the rob snow show tune in weekdays starting at nine on rogers tv and city news 1011 fm and 1310 a.m number one for local news in ottawa and the valley Brought to you by Ignite TV.